and give everybody a warm welcome to this meeting of the Education Committee. Agenda item one is apologies. Are members aware of any apologies? Nope. Okay, no apologies, Clark. Agenda item two is chairperson's business. Uh, in relation to the General Teaching Council, Northern Ireland, can I remind members that the committee agreed to arrange an oral briefing from the Department of Education and the General Teaching Council on the role of the General Teaching Council, its legal barriers, and some concerns we have received at our meeting on Wednesday, the 24th of March, 2021. The, the briefing will take place on Wednesday, the 24th of March, 2021. The committee also agreed that prior to this briefing, we would uh, take a briefing informally from the Northern Ireland Teachers Council uh, in relation to the General Teaching Council in Northern Ireland. That informal briefing has been arranged for next Tuesday, the 9th of March, starting at 9.30 a.m. via Starleaf. And if I could encourage as many members as possible to attend that informal briefing, as it is obviously extremely relevant for the formal briefing that we will receive on Wednesday, the 24th of March. Okay, members agreed with that approach? Agreed? agreed. Thank you. Okay, members, in tabled items, then there are a number of uh, items I just wanted to refer you to. Uh, at pages 3 to 31 is correspondence from the department in relation to school restart and exams, COVID-19 vulnerable children plan, benchmarking, vaccination and pandemic learning. The recruitment arrangements for uh, chairperson, vice chairperson and panel members of the New Decade New Approach Independent Review of Education, um, which it states are unregulated appointments. Uh, that we might want you might want to have a closer look at that and notification of the termination of the transformation program. All matters that we might wish to ask the minister about when he's with us next week. Uh, just to bring those items to your attention and tabled items. These are tabled in the correspondence, uh, and I wanted to make sure you had advance notice uh, of them um, in advance of the committee's oral briefing with the minister next week, scheduled for 11.30, and you will uh, wish to ask questions in relation to those. Conscious we have a, a short meeting today, um, so I'm not going to raise too many other items other than um, ref refer you to the launch of the emotional uh, health, health and wellbeing framework uh, emotional mental wellbeing framework and the uh, teachers pay settlement progress that has been announced this week. Members want to wish uh, raise any other items? Joe, could I just come in a second? Yes, Pat. Uh, g g given that the minister is going to be briefing us and the, the couple of issues you raised are about restart and about the emotional and uh, wellbeing issues that you flagged up there. I mean, we have been asking now for quite a while about the minister to put in place an integrated strategy for children going back to school. And, you know, we had Siobhan O'Neill in a while back there who agreed with the assessment that there was a tsunami coming down the tracks at us uh, in regard to emotional wellbeing issues. Um, and... What one of the reasons the minister uh, gave for not really having a strategy in place was that there were it was a challenging financial situation, budgetary situation. But then shortly after that, the uh, it became clear that the three hundred million COVID funding could be carried over into the next financial year. So that uh, that excuse was kicked out of the park. And to date, we've seen nothing from the minister. And I wonder, could it be flagged up to him before he comes in next week that we would like to hear what his actual plans are to deal with the problems children are going to be facing when they go back to school? But my, you know, when you take into account that the minister himself was pushing for uh, all children to go back to school next week, uh, and one of the reasons being advanced for that is because of the mental health and the emotional problems that children are facing as a result of the, the pandemic, the lockdown, not being at school and so on. So we, we need to see some sort of response. I've, I've already acknowledged the good that the engagement program did previously. Uh, but, you know, 
that was only a small beer compared to what's required now. Uh, and, and we need to see something from the minister on those issues. Thanks. Thanks, Pat. Uh, yes, I think we're entitled to uh, advise the minister that we'll want to hear what his comprehensive plan for educational, emotional and physical recovery for children and young people is uh, in the in the next few months and beyond when they make that return to school. Members content for us to um, raise that with the minister in advance of next Wednesday. Agreed? Okay. Agreed. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, Clark, any other members want to raise any uh, points in, that have been discussed there in chairperson's business? No. Okay, then we'll move to agenda item three members, which is draft minutes. Can I refer members to draft minutes of the committee meeting of 24th of February at page six of your meeting packs and seek your agreement that the minutes are a complete and accurate record of proceedings agreed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, there are no matters arising. Unless any members want to raise a matter? No. Okay, then, members, move to our first briefing and with the Integrated Education Fund. And can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove all members from the spotlight and to add the witnesses? Can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 14? Briefing papers from the Integrated Education Fund at page 16. And uh, give a very, very warm welcome uh, to Miss Amanda McNamee, Principal Lang College, Hilary Copeland, Chair of Trustees at the Integrated Alumni, uh, Sam Fitzsimmons, Communications Director at Integrated Education Fund, and note that March is indeed Integrated Education Month, uh, and I believe we are close to 40 years uh, of integrated education at Lagan College since it was established in 1981. So I'm uh, delighted to have you, you with us uh, today. Um, can I advise witnesses that the committee will give you 10 to 15 minutes to make an opening statement, followed by questions from the members, which can be answered by anyone across the panel of witnesses. Can I hand over to you then, Sam, are you starting us off? Yeah, okay. Um, thank Very you, welcome, Chris. Sam. Um, I'd like to um, thank the committee for their invitation and the opportunity to brief them on integrated education. Um, just a brief introduction, my name is Sam Fitzsimmons from Integrated Education Fund. and I'm joined this morning by Amanda McNamee, the Principal of Lagan College, and Hilary Copeland, Voluntary Chair of the Board of the Integrated Alumni. There are three parts to our briefing today. The first part will provide an overview of the journey of integrated education since the establishment of Lagan College and hopefully address a few myths and misconceptions around integrated education. The second part of the briefing will be uh, from Amanda, uh, who will hopefully give the committee an understanding of integrated education within the school setting. And Amanda will share her experiences uh, and insight as a principal of an integrated college. The third part of the briefing uh, will look at integrated education from a young person's perspective. Hilary will offer some personal reflections of her experiences of attending an integrated school. I'm aware that Colin Cabinet provided a historical context of integrated education when he briefed the committee on the independent review of integrated education. I will focus on integrated education from the establishment of Lagan College. A brief overview, uh, founded in 1981 by a group of parents in response to the challenges of community co conflict and a religiously divided school system, Lagan College was the first planned integrated school in Northern Ireland. By 1987, other parents had established seven new integrated schools, and that year, the Northern Ireland Council for Integrated Education was formed as a charitable organization to coordinate the efforts of integrated education and support parents groups in the process of opening new schools. In the 1989 education order, a statutory duty was placed on the Department of Education 
to encourage and facilitate the development of integrated education. This was underlined in the Belfast Agreement. In 1992, the IEF was established as a charity to provide a financial foundation for the development and the growth of integrated education in Northern Ireland. The IEF mandate is derived from the express demand of parents and schools who seek to offer integrated education for their children. 40 years on, from the opening of Lagan College, the majority of our children and young people of school age continue to be educated within a single identity setting. Around 90% of pupils in Northern Ireland are educated in schools that identify with a single tradition or denomination. Only 7.2% of pupils in control schools are Catholic, whilst 1.1% of pupils in Catholic maintained schools are Protestant. Despite the statutory duty to encourage and facilitate the development of integrated education and the commitment in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, no integrated school has ever been planned for by the Department of Education. Given the inertia at an official and at a political level to encourage and facilitate integrated education, it is a remarkable achievement that there are now over 24,000 pupils attending 65 integrated schools and demand for integrated education and school places continues to grow. In 2018, the Sky News Attitudinal Survey highlighted that 69% of respondents agreed that every school in Northern Ireland should be an integrated school. And in the academic year 2018 to 19, 21% of first preference applications for a place at an integrated post-primary school were not successful due to oversubscription. In the academic year 2019 to 20, we had eight parental ballots were held on schools transforming the integrated status, all demonstrating between 70 and 100% support. I'm going to try and sort of give a little bit of a definition on integrated education. On the department's website, it defines integrated education as bringing children and staff from Catholic and Protestant traditions as well as those of other faiths and none together in one school. Integrated schools ensure that children from diverse backgrounds are educated together. A 2014 High Court judge, High Court judgment, sorry, further clarified what defines integrated education. In Judge Tracy's ruling, he stated that integrated education is a standalone concept. He went on to say, a school which is fundamentally constituted to serve one religious denomination over another with a partisan board cannot be said to be serving members of different religious groups equally. As against this, an integrated school strives to achieve an equal balance in relation to worship, celebration and exposure of both faiths. This is, restrict this is reflected in its constitution and the board must strive in its ethos to achieve this. What I'm going to do now is hand over to Amanda, who will give a little bit of an insight into what it's like to teach in an integrated school. Thank you. Um, Amanda hasn't joined us just yet. We're trying to reach her. Jefferson. Okay. Um, Sam, do you want to bring in Hillary at that point, or do you want to take any questions? We bring in Hillary. Yeah, well, I'm happy to bring in Hillary okay. and let's bring in. Hillary. Let's bring Hillary, and we'll see if we can get uh, Amanda in the in the meantime. You're very welcome, Hillary. Good morning, Chris. Good morning, everybody. Um, hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. So thank you very much for inviting inviting us here. Um, and for letting me share my story about integrated education. Since October 2014, I have been involved with establishing um, an organization for past peoples of integrated education in Northern Ireland, now a registered charity, integrated alumni and our supporters, lobbying and campaign for integrated education movement, as well as offering a social network for past peoples who attend, attended an integrated school here. 
As you know, integrated schools educate together children from Catholic and Protestant backgrounds, as well as those from other faiths and nuns, in an inclusive, welcoming, inspiring environment. The school I went to is called Newbridge Integrated College. It's situated about a 40-minute drive south of Belfast, 40 minutes north of the border. When I started at Newbridge, the school was in its third year of its existence. There had been a long delay in the development of the school build in 1995. And when a site in the small rural village of Loughborough, Glyndon, County Down was finally secured, the farmer who owned the field would only permit building work to start after his harvest was taken in. So construction for the work of the new school commenced in August with just 17 days to go until it opened. But opened it did, and New Ridge opened with a school in grand total of 76 people and eight teachers. So when I started in 1997, there were 156 people making up the entire student body, which um, I don't think would fill the long gallery in part of the building. As an alumni organization, our members are often invited to return to their schools to speak at assemblies, present at prize days. But during my time at Newbridge, there were no class to invite back, as no one had left yet. As you all know, Northern Ireland in 1997 was a very different place to where we are now. Tony Blair's Labour Party had just won a majority. In Northern Ireland, Sinn Féin had become the third largest party here, winning two seats in Westminster. Local government elections, the UP were the largest unionist party, SDLP the largest nationalist party. A Fianna Foyle progressive democrat coalition was in office after a general election in Ireland. Gordia Hearn was the Taoiseach. There were riots all across Northern Ireland that summer before terms started. 1997 was the height of the Drum Creek standoff. Uh, there were many protests in national areas. They had erupted into violence. Hundreds of British army troops had been flown into Northern Ireland that summer. Later that month, the IRA announced the renewal of the 94 ceasefire. That September, whenever I was starting school, political talks resumed. The Good Friday Agreement was signed the following year, in the spring term of my first year at an integrated school. So in 1997, integrated education as a way out of our violent history for the people who live here wasn't a new concept, but it certainly wasn't commonplace. When I was 11 and looking at what secondary school I wanted to attend, none of these things ever occurred to me. I was entirely oblivious to the massive societal change that was occurring around me. My reasons for going to Newbridge were not based on a hope for peace that would potentially change our lives. I came from a very small, rural, controlled primary school. It was made up of largely of families from that local village and the wider farming community. I had got an A in the transfer test and where I was from, that meant that there was an assumption I would attend a local grammar school. I went to two open days, the grammar school in the nearby town of Bambridge that had been established for over 200 years, and to Newbridge, where we moved around the school site, not down hallowed corridors decorated with photos of esteemed past pupils, but outside on recently gravelled paths from Porta Cabin to Porta Cabin. I loved it, and I decided that Newbridge was where I wanted to be. I was aware that there would be Catholics attending at Newbridge, and that this had something to do with going to a different church from mine. But I find that my church was quite often a little bit dull and Catholic churches looked a lot more colorful, a lot more exciting. I didn't really see this being a problem for me. My parents let me do what I wanted and I was very excited to start, but it was only whenever I grew older that I was able to understand that not everyone thought that this was as good an idea as I did. I found out that the parents of my friends from primary school did not agree with Protestants and Catholics going to the same school, that they did not think my parents should have let me go, and they expressed as such. Um, I became very aware of the fear of the unknown, and many in our rural community might not have experienced the same levels of violence that were regularly making the evening news back then. But every person then and every person here has been touched by the conflict in some way. And I became very aware that it takes a long time 
for certain traditions to be reimagined or prejudices to be dismantled. I know that there are individuals who have not spoken to my parents since. Other people told me um, and told my parents that it was a mistake not to send me to an academic school, that I was bright, that I was capable and I wouldn't be challenged and I wouldn't receive adequate teaching by going to Newbridge. And now that I'm older and I know a lot more about education systems being dominated by targets and league tables than challenges of the employment market, um, I can understand why other parents might have had concerns about a school with no academic record and knowing and not knowing if the risk would, would pay off. Myself and hundreds and thousands of other students have proved that they are unfounded. When I look back now as an adult, um, I think about how brave we all were to take this huge leap of faith on an unfinished school that had no record, no past pupils, no reputation, no established rules or policies or records. Um, at the time inside our school walls, there were two reasons for faith in that notion. But I also think about the first teachers who went to Newbridge and left their jobs to come to the um, And all of those parents who wanted their children to be brought up in that environment and who thought it was the risk. I'm very proud of that we all had faith in this experiment and in the unknown, and that all the staff and the parents and people who built that school worked very hard. They wanted to make it work. And they were very sure of that a belief in this model of education, despite its humble beginning, and despite us being in the minority, would help us build a better future. They were very sure that it would work. And I never really thought it, about it being particularly unusual until I moved away from Northern Ireland and tried to explain my integrated education to friends that I made elsewhere. They were very confused as to what this might mean, because certainly in most areas of the UK, the idea of girls and boys from a variety of backgrounds, different religions, different ethnicities, different communities, being educated in one building together is in fact simply true. And it was when I moved back to Northern Ireland that, and I started working alongside people who had had a very different upbringing from my own, that I realised that that essentially is what it meant to me too, that learning and working and making friends with all kinds of people, where we were taught to talk openly about our differences, to directly address those, to be proud of those, to joke about the same things we saw our political representatives fight about. That was our normal education. It was just good to us. And I'm moving back, and I became very conscious of that for most children in Northern Ireland, that is not their experience at school. Um, I find that this is something I felt and hoped that by publicly sharing my experience, I could perhaps change that. Hilary, sorry to cut across you, but can I can can I just ask you to draw your remarks to a close? Because I see that Amanda has joined us as well. But th thank you so much for your evidence so far. Not at all. Um, I'll just finish um, to say that for this generation that I have grown up, um, who the late journalist Lyra McKee termed the ceasefire babies, um, we are looking about our society. It's not just orange and green. We're looking at unionism or nationalism as one of many, a multitude of identities that we hold. For these young people, politics also means racial equality, LGBTQ plus rights, feminist centered politics, acceptance of gender identity, a commitment to the climate crisis. I'm very proud of the young activists I work with. Um, and I know that they do what they do because they believe educating all young people together in a deliberately inclusive way is really vital to slowly changing the divisions in our society. Thank you so much, Hilary. And if I could bring Amanda in then before we go to questions. Lo lovely to see you, Amanda. I believe I'm, I'm wishing Lagan College a, a happy 40th anniversary, uh, which uh, an anniversary which I share with you this year. <laughs> uh, so happy birthday. I think you're just, wait, you're just waiting for me to uh, compliment you and say you look a lot younger. No, I definitely don't, so <laughs> thank you. Thanks, because Amanda. Apologies. Um, I've moved to a classroom environment, which is probably where I'm more comfortable because um, the lovely thing about schools is they're so um, 
we're so safety conscious that we were finding a difficulty um, getting the Starleaf program updated there. So listen, apologies for being slightly late in joining you. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, just to let the panel know a wee bit of context, um, I have been in education for 27 years and have had the privilege to work um, in controlled in the controlled sector in the grammar uh, school, non-selective as well, and then also in Drumrah College and now formerly Lagan College. And I'm privileged to be the principal of Lagan, and I'm also a director of NICE as well. Um, yes, thank you for inviting us this morning. I suppose. Uh, Sam from the IEF and Hillary have given you a flavour of what integrated education is. Um, often there are myths that people would have about integrated schools and hopefully by talking to you a little bit more about my context at LAG and that will give you a flavour of that. So where we have seen, I suppose, in the last uh, decade or two, a real change in schools in Northern Ireland, which is to be welcomed. Um, we, all, we have seen an inclusion model happening. Uh, by chance where more children from different ethnicities and backgrounds have gone into local schools, which is to be very much to be welcomed. The difference, I suppose, between that and an integrated school is that we are intentionally planned for. So we intentionally plan to educate all children together under the same roof. Uh, children from the two main uh, communities, religious communities in Northern Ireland of Catholic faith and of Protestant faith. And that would be the mission statement of Lagan College when it was founded in 1981 by parenting parents who wanted to ensure that their children could be educated together. So in Lagan here, we have uh, we intentionally plan to have children, 40% of, of Catholic faith and 40% Protestant faith and 20% of other and none, uh, to recognise our statutory duty to be an integrated school. We're also a co-ed school and we serve the needs of children who are aged 11 to 18. And we're also an all-ability school. And so I suppose the difference that sometimes people have asked me about what an inclusive school is compared to an integrated school is, as I said, we are intentional and we are planned for that reason. The reason for being is for social uh, uh, peace and cohesion and to build a shared future for the children who um, attend schools in Northern Ireland. In my context at Lagan College, we've been the first school, the first integrated planned school in Northern Ireland. Uh, we grow, we've grown from a very small environment of 28 young people in 1981 and we've been very, very privileged by the support of our parents uh, to grow the school now to 1,425 children and we have over 200 adults working as a team to support these young people growing up. We see such a great uh, breadth of cultures, backgrounds, traditions um, and sometimes people who uh, consider integrated education can sometimes be of the belief that, that it is a space where we cleanse children's cultures and backgrounds and that we expect everybody to be the same. Uh, to the contrary is what actually happens in an integrated school. Uh, we purposely and intentionally plan to celebrate the differences. Uh, we hold uh, different religious festivals and traditions together. Uh, we, for example, we've just had Ash Wednesday, although we couldn't do it because of obviously we're working remotely. Ordinarily, all the children would come together and appreciate what Ash Wednesday means to particularly the children of Catholic faith, but also those children of faith would sometimes receive a blessing as well on that particular day. But it's not just the Christian calendar, it's also uh, children who have other faith backgrounds, other and none as well. The other aspects that sometimes people aren't sure about in terms of an integrated school is how do we teach the curriculum? So we have a very broad curriculum here in Lagan when it comes to GCSE and A-level because we serve the needs of a whole variety of children of all different abilities. Um, so we offer over 45 GCSEs and 25 A-levels. So we really have something to suit every learner's style. Things like history, RE, which can sometimes be difficult and controversial in a Northern Ireland setting, um, are tackled in a very sensitive way and in a way where children can share their experience. So we try to look at moments in history from everybody's perspective so that we can be respectful of how each person feels. And we encourage the children in Lagan to talk about controversial issues such as politics, such as nationality. Uh, we've had a right time recently talking about Brexit, uh, which has kept the children engaged. Um, and obviously things like uh, more recently covid and uh, Black Lives Matter. So we don't try to shy away from anything that's going to be controversial. We try to discuss it uh, in a shared lens. 
I suppose that's given you a brief flavour. I'm conscious, Chris, that you maybe want to open up questions. I don't want to take too much of the committee's time. That's uh, great. Um, yes, yeah, Sam would have provided you with a bit of a briefing paper as well. Thanks so much, Amanda and Sam and Hillary for that, that comprehensive uh, set of, of opening remarks. Uh, absolutely keen to bring other members in here for uh, engagement with you and, and discussion. Can I, I just ask a, a couple of brief questions? Sam, could, could you um, uh, revise that stat from, I think it was 2018-19, where there's 21% of applications to integrated schools weren't successful? Can I, I just check, make sure I'm accurate on that? On, on that statistic of yes. 2018, yeah. 30, absolutely, it comes from actually the good relations um, review. So uh, that's, that, that is the government's figures. Okay, so one, one in five applications uh, for integrated school in 2018-19 from TO good relations figures shows that they weren't able to get their, uh, their integrated school that they'd applied for. Okay, and, and okay. you'd also mentioned statistics around the uh, percentage of um, Catholic pupils in uh, controlled schools and, and uh, Protestant and Catholic schools. It, it seems startlingly low figures there. 1.1% um, Protestant faith pupils in Catholic maintained and 7.2% in of uh, Catholics in control schools, is that, uh, did I pick that up right, yeah? You, you, you did indeed, and again, Chris, we're drawing those uh, figures from the Department of Education's uh, own public available uh, information. Okay, and I, I, had, I had a number of other questions, but your, your briefing has, has touched upon all, all of them uh, comprehensively. Um, I suppose, Hilary, something that you said really struck me, um, and I think sometimes we forget. Um, your, your attendance at an integrated school cost your family friendships to this day? Yes, certainly I think that there was been, that we come from a very small, small community um, and, and you, you know whenever there are people who decide to cross the street to not speak to you um, and that was the experience that my parents were able to me. Um, I'm glad to say that there was worse than that, but it is frightening that quite strongly people felt like that. that, that that's, that's startling. Thankfully, you also set out many of the benefits uh, that you experienced as a result of that, that brave decision from your, your family, so thanks for that. Can I, I'll bring in the other members at, at this point. Can I bring in Deputy Chairperson uh, Pat Sheehan, MLA? Pat there. That's mid. Yeah, it should be there. We just need to bring the members that's back. Me now. That's, that's me now. There you are, Pat. Thank you. Thank you. There seemed to be some difficulty on muting there. No um, thanks very much, Chris, and, and, and thanks to Sam, Amanda, and Hilary for your presentation there. I have just a couple of questions. First of all, can I say... I uh, am a big supporter of the whole concept of an integrated education system. Uh, I think it's long past the time when people are being uh, educated on a segregated basis. Uh, however, having said that, I do have some uh, issues around the current model as it exists. And for example, could I ask you, are there still some integrated schools who use academic selection? Yeah, um, can, can I perhaps maybe hand that uh, question over to Amanda? Pat? Sure, thank you. Yes, hi, Pat. Yeah, so I have, I have worked in non-selective and uh, Lagan is actually a bilateral school, which takes a proportion of children um, who, have, who are using at the minute the unregulated uh, selected model, okay? So to be truly all ability, you have to, again, it's about intentionally getting children of different abilities. So as I have worked in non-selective schools, just, just by you know, chance, whoever has come, uh, the school have met the needs of the children. When I became principal here, um, obviously I was uh, having to become familiar with the bilateral model. And the bilateral model, certainly in Lagan and certainly in another integrated school, there are two who are following a bilateral model was really because of the context that we're working in Northern Ireland where we do have secondary and grammar schools. 
So to truly be able to move children from primary to secondary to get a intentional, and I come back to those two words, intentionally planned all ability group of young people coming to the school to show a fair proportion of children of different ability levels, we have used a bilateral model in Lagan. Now, it is something that I have always asked, even as far back as Katrina Ruan, being Education Minister. When the 11 plus was removed from Northern Ireland, I did ask Katrina Ruan uh, to really consider at that point when the unregulated tests came in, we continued to have the grammar uh, secondary model, that the whole system would look at the whole issue of all ability education and how children transfer from primary to secondary. And I think that's probably long overdue, and hopefully that would come through the independent educational review. But for me as a practitioner working in an integrated school, and I have worked uh, part in a grammar and a non-selected secondary school, I can truly really say in Lagan we have the full range of ability. And that just hasn't by chance. It has happened, happened because it's been planned. So we are very um, proud of the fact that we meet the needs of 100 children with statements of special needs. But we also meet the needs of children who, uh, who will require help with some of their, their, their learning, but also those who, have, um, who, don't, who will never require any help with their learning in terms that they are a, truly above average. Um, so every child has to be seen as an individual in every school context. Um, so Lagan College would certainly support there being a review of how all ability education could be furthered in Northern Ireland. Okay, Th thanks for that, Amanda. And uh, I accept what you're saying about your own school. My my concern would be that if we're going to talk about a really integrated system, it's, it's not just about religion uh, or community background. It's also about the socioeconomic background that, that, that children come from and a proper integration of, of our whole education system. And, and just on the same theme, and there have been some concerns raised about this also, that uh, some, uh, some integrated schools do lack a, a, a critical level of inclusivity in terms of the type of sport that are organised, uh, the expression of culture, the teaching of history and the marking of historical events and, and so on. So, uh, you know, and I, I've had some discussions with Trevor Lunn about this, who's a great supporter of, of the integrated education system as it is. Uh, and, and he's put me right on a few uh, occasions uh, some misconceptions I had about the integrated uh, system as it stands. So I don't want to appear to appear to be too critical, but certainly quite a number of integrated schools that I'm aware of don't, for example, provide Gaelic sports. They don't teach Irish. And there are issues around the wearing of emblems, for example, that some integrated schools would, for example, allow children to wear a poppy, but wouldn't allow uh, children to wear an Easter lily, for example. So th those are just some concerns. And I suppose this goes to the issue of inclusivity, like my previous question on socioeconomic background. So I'm just wondering, could you um, talk about that for a moment or two? Okay, um, Pat, you, you, you're um, given an analysis in fairly broad terms uh, around inclusivity uh, within integrated schools. Um, all integrated schools are on, on various journeys and, and all have different resources. I'm sure Amanda can um, give you some information about the work that her school has done and the success that they have had in the likes of GAA uh, sports. Um, but there are other schools that have transformed from controlled status to integrated status are on, on a journey of, of uh, sort of being much more inclusive. Uh, and that journey will continue um, as the school evolves and develops. But a lot of this comes down to resources. Uh, many schools just don't have the resources to uh, provide the range of, of sporting and cultural uh, activities that, that perhaps maybe other schools in the integrated sector may have. However, uh, one of the things that is, is absolutely true is 
the ethos within an integrated school is about that inclusive celebration. You do raise, I think, a number of key points about uh, inclusivity and in terms of the segregation that, that, that happens within our schools. There is the religious and there is the cultural within the structural setup, uh, but equally that socioeconomic um, issue around um, academic output and, uh, and support, I think needs to be part of a wider discussion within our education system. And hopefully the independent review will be able to address some of those issues, particularly around social economic uh, segregation. I need to keep this moving, folks. Amanda, do you want to take pride in a recent Gaelic sport uh, victory of yours, I think I recall? <laughs> well, I'm not going to do that personally, although I did feel like <laughs> running onto the Gaelic pitch with the boys, to be honest with you. But yes, uh, yeah, we've had, I mean, it's, 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 it's a fair question, Pat. You know, uh, I come from a very uh, integrated family unit, and it's, these, these questions are fair questions that people have in their own home places, not least in schools as well. Yeah, for Lagan, I mean, obviously, uh, as Sam has said, we've we've had the we've had forty years, so we've had a quite a ability to come of age, and and we've been able to go through some of these things that do come up in, in an environment of a school environment where you're trying to raise young people with their parents to understand what it means to live in a pluralistic, inclusive society. So for us, in, in the Lagan context, because we do have the resources and we do have the finance to be able to do it, we're able to offer such a range of sport and to be very inclusive. We're also able to, when the children ask us to look at a sport that maybe we're not currently offering, that we have the money and the personnel to be able to, to look at that as well. You know, and when we built the new school here, right down to the, the use of colour in terms of how, uh, whether we used um, orange, white, green, uh, blue, red paint was thought through. Looking at what posts we actually had in our football pitch had to be thought about, you know, and what that would mean to the community looking at the pitch there. The choice of uh, the choice of um, goal keep goal post that we chose. Um, so we, we are also an ability that we can teach. We teach Irish as enrichment to every young person in year eight. We make that very clear to their parents that everybody understands what we're trying to do here, and that is called enrichment for us. And any child then can choose, to, for example, to go on and, and study Irish or study Spanish or study French um, or Polish, etc., if they want to. The mention of emblems is an important one, Pat. And we've had, obviously, the anniversary decade, uh, centenary of anniversaries over the last of 10 years. Very important anniversaries we've had, and, and such as you mentioned there, the Easter Rising. And uh, our children took part in a north-south 10-year uh, program where they have been working with children uh, from, from the south of Ireland, um, and they have been looking at some of those issues on the landscape. When it comes to the likes of remembrance, we often show the children uh, to take their leave from the likes of the tea shop and what's happening in Ireland. You know, Ireland has become a very progressive uh, country and the children can see that there is change happening in the world, in Ireland and in the north of Ireland. Um, and that, that really helps us to move on. So as a school in Lagan, if a child wants to wear an em emblem, for us it's about how it's perceived by other people. Whether it's, whether it's being worn in a respectful way to mark something that they hold dear. And we have a saying in Lagan, if something is important to one of us, it needs to be understood by the rest of us. And that's really the premise that we come from when we look at things like wearing emblems and when we look at our politics and when we look at our national, nationality. But there should be no reason why a child can't say when they're coming to an integrated school, you know, I'm Irish and I am actually I'm a nationalist. There should be no reason why a child is told to, to keep quiet about that, not to have a conversation about that. And similarly, there's no reason why a child can't say, well, look, I consider myself to be British, and I believe that Northern Ireland should stay in, in, in the Union. You know, And that's the type of conversation that we want to engender in the young people, certainly in my school context. OK. Thanks. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, Pat. OK, thanks, Pat. OK, thank you. Thank uh, can you I bring in Robin Newton, MLA, please? Thank you, Chair, and uh, <clears throat> I welcome Amanda, Henry, and Sam. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Good morning. I, I great difficulty uh, hearing Hillary, so I apologise if I uh, missed uh, uh, much of what Hillary said. I, I, I don't really have any questions uh, as such. You see, I, I'm a I'm a supporter of integrated education. I want integrated education. 
And I wish really that this was a, a discussion that we were not having. Um, that there was no need to, to have a discussion around integrated education. Um, and my integrated education is different in the sense that uh, I chose, or my wife and I chose, uh, encouraged our children to go to Methodist College, um, which is, a, a, I believe, a naturally integrated uh, college. Um, I, in all my, my years, having two pupils uh, at the college uh, a few years apart, in all the discussions that I had with, uh, from the principal uh, down to uh, uh, class teachers, uh, heads of departments, uh, there was never a discussion around Protestant Catholic or percentages. And it's quite obvious that, uh, uh, and my wife and I chose Methodist College or encouraged Methodist College because there were children from all backgrounds uh, all faiths, uh, and I suppose some from non non faith uh, as well, and and there was a good socio economic mix uh, in the school as well, uh, and I think that that, that was uh, part of the the reason why we we encouraged our children uh, to go there that it was a naturally integrated college with a long long history of, of attracting pupils. Uh, from from a, a different backgrounds, despite the fact that it was originally established for the education of Methodist uh, ministers and children. I do think there is another piece of uh, truly integrated education uh, happening, um, and that's with Our Lady of St. Pat's at Knock, where the latest figures that I heard from Our Lady of St. Pat's was that 10%, and that was a couple of years ago, 10% of, of the pupils uh, were not from a Catholic background attending, and I suspect that 10% has, has gone up. And that indicates to me that parents were making the decision uh, because of the, well, possibly because of the, 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 the closeness of the school, um, but also for the academic record of, of, of the school as well. So uh, I'm in favour of integrated education. I wish we weren't discussing uh, integrated education today. I'm in favour of the concept of all of our children being educated together. Thanks for that, Robin. Uh, Sam, do you want to respond to any of that or happy to, to do so in the course of other questions? Well, I just, I, I guess, Chris, to respond to, to Robin is, is uh, that, yes, Methody, and there are a number of schools across Northern Ireland who have a, a good mix of um, uh, within their school. However, the underlying figures um, that, that I presented earlier on, that 90% of our schools in Northern Ireland um, are predominantly one tradition or the other, remains the same, uh, even though there are those those a number of schools across Northern Ireland that, that have reasonably good mixed uh, enrolments. I think we'll also um, just highlight and go back to what um, what Amanda had said about integrated education, that it is planned in terms of what happens within the school. Um, it doesn't happen by chance or by accident. Uh, and that there is a uh, focus on celebrating difference. I, I'm not quite sure, you know, how that is celebrated in, in Methody. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Robin, Robin would have a, an insight into that. Equally, I think it's worth noting that, that the two schools that, that Robin touched on are grammar schools. Um, and back to, to uh, Pat's reference about socioeconomic segregation, I think that needs to be thrown into the mix as well. Okay, thanks for that, Sam. Can I bring in Daniel McCrossan, MLA? Thanks. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you to Amanda, Hillary, and Sam. Uh, we have met on occasion, and um, it's very good to have you with us today, and, and thank you for 
uh, your uh, uh, introductions and for uh, some background. Um, I'll, ju I'll just jump straight to questions because I know the chair is very strict on time these days, especially with Pat, especially with Pat Sheehan there as the new member. <laughs> Pat Money Jeb and Pat Money Jeb. Um, you've quoted a 2018 Sky News survey as reporting that 69% of respondents agreed that every school should be integrated. But some would suggest that what people were really agreeing to is that schools should contain pupils of mixed religion. These two concepts may not always be the same. So two points on that. How would you describe the ethos of an integrated school? And secondly, how is the integrated ethos taught? Thank you. Okay. Should I go back to the earlier briefing in relation to um, the definition of integrated education that Judge Tracy um, in his High Court ruling give in relation to integrated education? Okay. Which is which is integrated education as a standalone concept, mm -hmm. a school which is fundamentally con th th this is not an integrated school, a school which is fundamentally constituted to serve one religious denomination over another, with a partisan board, cannot be said to be serving members of different religious groups equally. As against this, an integrated school strives to achieve an equal balance in relation to worship celebration and exposure to both faiths. This is reflected in its constitution and the board must strive in its ethos to achieve this. That is the difference between an integrated school and a mixed school, uh, the type that, that uh, Robin highlighted with Methody and St. Pat's. In relation to what actually the ethos of an integrated school and what happens, perhaps maybe if I go back to uh, Amanda, to give an overview there. Yes, yes, thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Nice to see you again. Yeah, no, this has been really interesting. The last couple of questions have been really interesting debate. Um, uh, and as I say, I, I, uh, I think Robin and I spoke at one point. I'm very fortunate to have worked in Methodist College, and I'm very fortunate to have one of my children is in Methody, and one of my children is in Lagan, you know. So on a personal level, I have a lot of uh, respect for other schools, and I have worked in those schools, and I am... I think this is where we need to, to come very acutely towards the issue of integration, as Sam has said, which is very defined, compared to an inclusive school. And there are many really good inclusive schools. And as I say, I suppose the Education Committee can feel, uh, as, as Robin has mentioned and Daniel, that a lot of schools have come a long way on the journey of, of sharing their educational experience. And that has to be welcomed. And we definitely... By natural means, as Robin and, and Daniel are maybe alluding to, we see a change function is happening in society. And we see that children from different uh, religious affiliations and none are naturally starting to attend different schools, which is really to be welcomed compared to where we were in the 80s with, with very clear segregation. But I suppose the discussion that we're having today is how the government, you know, how we as adults can actually try to make that a planned event where we're planning for more integrated schools to be available to more families because that there really aren't enough in terms of choices out there. Daniel, you have talked about, you know, how, is, is it taught? Yes, it's taught. The minute the children come into to Lagan and other schools, we have a taught programme of what it means to be in an integrated school and part of an integrated school community. So we talk about ourselves as being one school community, all right? And that's often people get, get misconstrued that one community means that, again, you have to uh, become sterile and you have to just fall into being one type of person. Absolutely not. So we're one community, but we're a community that lives, grows, develops, learns together, and we actually teach aspects of the curriculum with purpose and intention and planning. So I have the luxury as a parent of knowing these different models and a practitioner of knowing these different models. And I have been very privileged to work in schools such as the Boys Model, Methodist College. And I know exactly what goes on in schools and, and, and great work goes on. But in an integrated school, the, the clear difference is that we're looking at it from all angles of a child's uh, cultural, political, uh, national Ethnic, uh, ethnicity, sexuality, gender, family unit. We're actually purposely talking about these things and having it as a taught programme within the school, as part of our PD programme and as part of our school assemblies. Um, every opportunity that we have with children, 
uh, in school here in Lagan. Every conversation is intentionally uh, using the opportunity to help to, um, I suppose, open their minds to the world that Hillary has uh, mentioned to you that she has gone on to experience because that she is very comfortable going out into the real world of work and meeting folk. Last year, last year, just for final point, sorry, last year I was in Stramillis. I've been very um, welcomed into uh, speaking to the Stramillis students and the St. Mary's students who are um, planning to be teachers. And I asked a straw poll of the 200 participants in the room to stand up and let me know who had within their very close friendship group, as in within two or three in their friendship group, somebody in their friendship group from, from um, the other main tradition in Northern Ireland. And I was really surprised to see maybe less than 10% of those young men and women stood up to say that they knew somebody as a, as a close friend from the other community. Now, that's now 40 years on since Lagan College has been in existence and integrated schools have happened. And that told me a picture that not enough of our children are getting a chance to meaningfully grow up and live together. Amanda, th thank you very much uh, for, for that, and thanks to Sam as well. Uh, just to make a point before I, I ask a very uh, direct question. Do, so I went to uh, Straban Controlled Primary School. D David Canning, uh, who you'll often hear me speak about, was my former principal. Uh, and I went there as a young Catholic boy uh, and mixed with uh, children from all backgrounds, all walks of life, not caring if they were Catholic, Protestant or other. That's how I've always been raised by my parents. And that's the, that's what was uh, supported in uh, that school environment. It was natural integration. It wasn't forced. It didn't have labels. It, it was just normal. It was as education should be in Northern Ireland. And, and that might be down to the leadership of the school, but certainly it's something that I experienced very positively and helped shape me as a, as a person and did in no way diminished my values or principles or, or uh, uh, religious beliefs or otherwise. So there is a lot of good work going on within schools, uh, which, which I would describe as natural integration of children uh, uh, that aren't within the integrated movement. Uh, and Strabane Primary School is probably the strongest example they can find, and I'm sure there's many others in everyone's constituency, but just want to make that point. Uh, Chair, if you indulge me just briefly for this next one. Uh, I, I noticed, know, yeah, go ahead, Chair, go ahead. I, I notice uh, your presentation states that Lagan Valley, Amanda, uh, 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 Lagan Valley, Lagan, I'm th speak, thinking of Pat Catney, Lagan College uh, serves to uh, celebrate all we have in common uh, and appreciate the things that make us different and unique. Uh, you also tell us that everything is done together as one community, holding prayer, reflection, uh, time together in assemblies. And you've, you've given some very good examples of the good, good work that your school and, and you're doing as the leader of the school. Um, could you tell us uh, what the difference is between celebrating uh, the things you have in common and appreciating the things that make us different. Yeah, well, a lot of a lot of that, a lot of those. I mean, it's really interesting to hear your experience, Daniel, uh, as a young man. Um, my husband's also from Straban. <laughs> um, right. you'll, you'll, you know, the McNamee, the McNamee name goes far and wide in County. Big connection. Yeah. Um, and yeah, th th that point is well made. I mean, probably by the foresight of your parents, actually, that has been your journey of travel. You know, and that your parents' decision to send you to what was in effect a controlled school is, it was a, quite a decision, which is, is happening now more and more, which is, as I say, to be welcomed. Um, but um, it would be interesting if they, we, we were going to talk with David and yourself about then what your experience was within that school, uh, because that's, that's the difference. It's the, the experience of being in a school which, which is taking the time. When we say celebrating, we're allowing space and time uh, for the children to see themselves as part of the school, that they see around the school, um, you know, things that they're familiar with, posters about sport that they are familiar with within their parish or within their community, that they see references to um, uh, politics in a fair uh, way and a just way, that they see an opportunity to debate and to have conversations, that they see in assembly when we talk about uh, um, things such as Black Lives Matters, that they understand that people have differences of opinion and that we share that with the children. So that, that's, the, that's the difference. Whereas I could be in a, what I call an inclusive school from one tradition. And whilst I may feel very much welcome to that school, I may never see or hear or have those conversations going on in that school. So I could travel through some of the schools you've mentioned very happily, making friends, learning, but nobody will really take the time 
to talk about my faith background, my culture, my politics, my belief in uh, sexuality, uh, relationships, then none of that will actually happen. Okay, I need to move us on, Daniel. Yeah, thanks, thanks for your question. Just, just a very brief point, Chair. Uh, Amanda. It be 30 seconds. That, 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 those are very important points, uh, Amanda. And obviously, since I've been at primary school, the ethos or the, 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 the curriculum in schools and what schools are teaching now is very, very different, even in that short period of time. But just to put on record, I've been with Drumra uh, Integrated College in Oma on many occasions, and there is a lot of great work there, and they, they're a very strong example uh, of how, the, how, how this is done right and well. So I uh, just want to put on record. I'm glad to hear you're married to, Str- to Strabane, man. <laughs> good, 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 local, good local advertising, Daniel. Well done. Robbie Butler, MLA. Yeah. Thanks, Robbie. Um, I've been in Lega College a couple of times at some very uh, kind of tough um, political hostings. And, uh, and it is really good because one of the good things that you get is you get challenged uh, from all quarters. And it is, it's really, really good and healthy. Um, guys, you, this, it's, it's been a wonderful presentation and the questions have been good. Um, and I don't think there's anybody here that isn't supportive of, uh, sort of the definitions and outcomes. So I'm going to be slightly more challenging because I think we'll be unfair. Um, to to bring you on here and not sort of offer you a chance to be challenged and then give the answer hopefully that um, some people might like um, to get. So obviously the, the concept of integrated education um, first was in 1981. We're 40 years down the line. Northern Ireland isn't what it was in 1981. Um, it's not where it should be, by the way, um, but we have much to celebrate. So the absolute need for integrated edu- education in 1981 was was absolute. It may not have went far enough for, for people like yourself. Um, but is there a need for uh, a, a redefinition or a rethink of what integrated education is and should be or could be, given the fact that perhaps it hasn't went as far as it has? And we live in a very uh, residentially segregated country. I'm thinking particularly of areas like West and North Belfast, where perhaps segregation in many areas is 100%. And a lot of the school estate is in those areas. So how do we square that one? How do we actually move uh, in tandem to the residential segregation and the educational integration? Well, I, perhaps maybe if I, I could just pick up on how we move forward. Um, obviously, through area of planning, uh, there is an opportunity to look at the schools of state. And, and one of the big challenges facing uh, the education planning authorities will be in addressing the issue of 50,000 empty school desks. Uh, one of one of the big challenges is the number of small schools and rural communities who are unsustainable. Uh, isolated powers, there, there are schools across Northern Ireland which uh, may be less than a mile from each other uh, and both are unsustainable. There is an opportunity for the planning authorities to look at those schools, talk to the communities, engage with the communities, and perhaps what may come out of those conversations is a single school solution. And that single school solution may be an integrated school for the community. Um, I think that's a direction that, and certainly we, we are having come with the IEF um, and our colleagues in Ulster University are having with the planning authority to see how we can move to deliver a more effective and efficient education system and integrate it in its widest sense. Integrate it in how we we plan and how we deliver education. So I think that's one way in in terms of you talk about residential um, segregation that goes on. I think engaging with, with communities to ask what type of education provision they would like to see in their area is one way forward. Um, and in, in terms of um, where we, we define and do we need to reset um, the integrated balance of 40-40-20, uh, given the changing demographics within our society, I do think that's a conversation that needs to happen. Um, and I think that is probably something that uh, will emerge in discussions within the wider integrated movement, 
but equally when it comes to the independent review of education in Northern Ireland, again, I'm sure that would be on uh, the, the uh, remit in, in terms of how we, we deliver education. Robbie, I think you're on mute. Apologies. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Thank you. I've got two more questions rather than bringing anybody up because I'd like to get them, them done. Um, one of the things that, and looking at this and reading some of the studies, um, we, we perceive this in terms of whether you're a Protestant Catholic or other and you go to those schools. That's never really been the problem in Northern Ireland, in my estimation. It's more about how history is taught, perhaps, and it was picked up in a report uh, uh, in, by the University of Aberdeen uh, uh, some time ago. Um, so, obviously, Irish history is taught in some schools perhaps with sometimes with the bio and sometimes Irish history is not taught in other schools and it should be. Um, how is history taught? Um, I think that might be one of the, I mean, the, the, the things that needs that everybody always can maybe do with a, a re-schooling in. How is, it, how is history taught in an integrated uh, school? I, I, I think I'm not an educationalist in, in, in this, uh, so I'll hand over to, to Amanda to respond okay. to that, probably if that's okay. For, yeah. forgive, forgive me for saying so, but if we, if we can keep our, our answers uh, concise as well as our questions, that would, that would be great. Amanda, thank you. Yeah, um, you know, it's, uh, again, it's all, it, it, again, we have to plan it very carefully. Um, yes, whenever I uh, studied over in England, my background in history would have been British history. Um, and therefore, very interested when I came here to Northern Ireland to see, you know, that schools were actually were teaching. Some were teaching more of Irish history, some were teaching more British history. So in Lagan, it has to be both both um, parts of our history in terms of linked to British history and linked to Irish history have to be taught. Um, and we have to, ha it has to be taught that uh, different uh, children and their families um, and their backgrounds may have a different belief uh, or a different view on historical uh, incidents in time, um, but they should be recognized by us in schools. So um, we've done a, a huge amount of work since I've been here in the last 16 years particularly, as I mentioned, on those uh, centenary of anniversaries that, that have been, you know, that have been very sensitively planned out and well thought through before that we would approach them with young people. Uh, we obviously have uh, the history of Northern Ireland coming into fruition being this year and having to uh, consider that in a very sensitive way for children from all different communities and backgrounds as well. So history and um, politics, RE in particular, which sometimes can be the contentious issues for us, have to be um, approached very sensitively in terms of our team and our teachers that come in to work in an integrated school, they have to have that free training to understand that our job is not to um, force an opinion on a child or force a viewpoint on anything. Mm -hmm. Our job is to open their minds to uh, information and then for them to decide their, their, their views and opinions. And I think probably Hillary would probably comment on that maybe later. Okay. Very quick yep. final one, Robbie. Yep, cheers. And this probably is one for Hillary then. Um, so th thanks for that answer, Amanda. Um, so I'm going to ask this. It seems like a blunt question, okay? So I'm going to say, does integrated education work? And the reason I'm asking that, I'm just thinking in terms of output of a pupil. So obviously the purpose of a school is to educate and there's wider context beyond that. But what would be the difference in the output of an integrated school? Um, against uh, a, a, a child, uh, a young person leaving a, a controlled or maintained school, with regards to that overall. So, if you were genuinely trying to sell this, to other salespeople in the room, what would you say is the the outcome and the differences? Thanks, Robbie. Hillary. Uh, thank you, Robbie. Um, we, I, I mentioned whenever I spoke earlier that there were some there was some hesitancy from some quarters about me attending a school being an academic child and not going to a grammar school, whether I would receive adequate teaching. I mean, I um, continue to talk about my integrated experience because I really think that I thrive because I went to an integrated school. Um, there are smaller classroom sizes at an integrated school. There is, I had really great understanding of, sort of my, what I could do, but I also did not at any time feel that I was any way better than other people who were not academic and whose skill set lay and talents lay in other areas. That's something that I am really conscious of that not all young people experience. Um, I do worry about the sort of the lack of, of understanding in terms of the variety of socioeconomic backgrounds that people in Northern Ireland experience. I know particularly from my work now that is involved in we work with my organization that I work with, Fighting Words and I, we work with young people from age six to eighteen. And what we see is that education in Northern Ireland closes doors. 
once those doors are closed at an early point, they don't tend to open when it comes to opportunity, social mobility, um, and that is something that we are seeing, particularly related to poverty levels, literacy levels, which are some of the worst in Europe, in Northern Ireland. So there is an awful lot of talk in Northern Ireland about how great our education system is, but we're not actually seeing that with the young people who the doors. I can personally attest my experience at an integrated school. I got an academic education. I also learned from a very holistic pastoral sense about my society, my, my friends. My friends taught me a lot. I learned an awful lot about GAA that I never knew. I learned about cultural differences that were completely closed doors to me. And my friendship group helped educate me in a way that doesn't come necessarily from the front of the classroom. I think that's as important as, as any academic opinion. Thanks, Hilary. Thanks, Robbie. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Hilary. Thank you. William Humphrey, MLA. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks, thank you very much. Thanks for your presentation this morning. Um, very interesting discussion. Um, I would say that um, in my experience in North Belfast, we had uh, Kathleen O'Hare for some time at Hazelwood, who did fantastic work uh, across our community, and that's being continued by Maura Thompson, both of them excellent uh, uh, educationalists and, and tremendous leaders in our community. Um, I used to very much share Robin uh, Newton's viewpoint in terms of uh, integrated education, in terms of I want to see as many children as possible in, uh, educated together. Um, and, you know, he mentioned um, Methodist College where his children went. Uh, in North Belfast, we were a really good example of natural integrated education in Belfast Royal Academy, which historically has not just had pupils from the Roman Catholic and Protestant community, but also for a long time for the Jewish community, because that's where it was obviously largely centred around. And, and again, that has happened naturally. But I suppose one of the questions that I, that I wanted to ask is, and some of the questions that I, that I had have been answered, um, but one of the questions I wanted to ask is, to be honest, what is the, what is the attitude of the churches towards integrated education? Um, I... Uh... Well, we, we, we obviously um, try to engage with all key stakeholders, um, but there is a history, I guess, of resistance uh, by the churches to integrated education. Um, and I think there's a, a, a challenge uh, to the integrated education movement that uh, they need to engage more with church representatives to debunk some of the misconceptions that there are there about integrated education and, and, and to work towards, uh, rather than maintaining institutions, uh, work towards what is the best outcomes for children. Well, can, I mean, what, what does that mean? I mean, the challenges, I mean, I mean, are there some churches that are in support or are there some churches that are hostile? I mean, what, what, are, what is the position of the main churches? I, I, I think it would be very, very wrong for me to try and generalize about the churches. Uh, obviously, there are some uh, members of, of the, the, the main uh, religious Christian churches in Northern Ireland that would be supportive of, of integrated education, and there would be others that may be more resistant. Um, I don't think it's just one... Um, what one particular view that's coming out of the churches? But the churches per se, as in, you know, say the four main churches in the Christian denominations, that they haven't taken a position, have they, or have they? The I'm, not aware, the level? I, I'm not aware of a position, um, but per, perhaps maybe that is a question that should be asked directly to, to the main churches uh, mm. ra rather than... than uh, the integrated movement trying to, to uh, second guess the, the position of the churches. William, did I see so Amanda? Does, it, does Amanda want to come in and there? I think I see her hand raised, maybe in terms of her interaction with the churches, William. Yeah, no, I think okay. William, um, because Sam is obviously not, practic not a practitioner in an integrated school, it's probably easier for me to speak about that, you know. From, from what I can see, and I'm too young to know, <laughs> way back in the 1980s, in those early days, um, polit politi politicians and church leaders, I think, were nervous 
And I think that's understandable. You know, we're nervous about what integrated education would mean and would look like. We have come a long way. So on our, uh, on our board of directors, as our chair, we have um, Father Tom Faden, who was the provincial of the Jesuit order in Dublin for many years. And Father Tom has been affiliated to our school for nearly, nearly 15 years. And we have a very strong relationship uh, with, with all churches, certainly in the greater Belfast area. To the point where you know we, we've had um, we, every, annually every year we have a carol service, and what we do in Lydon is we reach out to uh, the local churches, and we have every year a carol service goes into a different uh, church and local community. So um, some years we've been at Not Presbyterian. Recently we were down at the St Paul Road uh, Presbyterian. We've been at St Bernard's, the Good Shepherd. You know, it is about opening up people's lives to the concept that people are practicing their religion and their choice of religion by choice, by free choice, and that children should not be afraid to visit the local mosque, which we take our year eights every year, uh, to a whole variety of different churches, uh, chapels, mosques, temples, so that our children who maybe haven't had the chance to go into somebody else's place of worship, it's opened up to them. And it's not something that they you know, are, 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 don't know about what goes on inside. Yeah. So in terms of in terms of the the governors of schools, you mentioned board of directors. Is it? But in terms of governors of schools, I mean, are the are the churches offered places in governors and in integrated schools, or what way does that work? We we don't have any governors who have to be um, associated to a church, uh, but we, they can be. Now, in my time, not like until the last eleven years, it's been principal. There isn't anybody who has offered to come on through a DE rep or through offering to come on. Uh, our representation comes from uh, parents, uh, teachers, directors, and DE reps. But, um, you know, there's a, anybody can become a, a member of the Board of Governors here, but it's, it's different to other schools which who have to have uh, representation from churches on their governance. We don't have to, but it is obviously not precluded and we welcome anybody who wants to be a governor of an integrated school. Okay. Sam, when you talk about challenges in terms of you know the, the, the issues between integrated education and the churches, um, do, do, do the education uh, um, sorry integrated education movement meet with the churches on a regular basis, or how does it work? Um, not on a regular basis, Morris, but but it is uh, I, I think uh, a key stakeholder in how we shape our education going into the future and sort of. Uh, having having more regular engagement with them would be a useful exercise. Okay, thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Thanks William. Thank you. Nicola Brogan, MLA. Thank you, Chair, and thanks to Sam, Hillary, and Amanda for um, your evidence this morning. I think it's been a really interesting discussion, so thank you for bringing it to the committee. Um, Amanda, I just want to touch on a few points you had made. First of all, congratulations to Lagan College um, on the 40 years. It's um, a really special year for you, and um, we wish you all the best with it. Um, I really enjoyed what you said there about um, how you and, and Lagan College promote each individual's um, identity and their culture. Um, I think that's so important. It has to be accepted, respected, and celebrated. Um, can I just come back to a point that was made earlier about um, the wearing of the Easter lily? Is it accepted in an integrated school in the north? It, it hasn't. Ironically, here it hasn't. We haven't had. Um, we haven't had it to come as a, a, a need from the children's point of view. Um, so to, to date, we've had children who've been very interested in wearing the. Um, uh, the Remembrance Poppy uh, from Ireland, which has the shamrock with the poppy in it, and also the white poppy, and that has become a big debate in the last couple of years. And I think that was because when we started to see change management happening between um, uh, Ireland and the north of Ireland coming together with some of those um, uh, occasions, uh, not to necessarily um, showcase war and conflict, but actually the opposite to showcase reconciliation and peace and, you know, moving society forward without having to, to fight with each other, you know. But we haven't, it hasn't come an issue in Lagan. But what has become interesting is, you know, children's um, concept of sport 
And so we've seen a lot of children feeling that they can wear, you know, they can absolutely wear sports clothing that has, that comes from, you know, traditionally maybe Gaelic compared to rugby, compared to foot soccer. You know, we've seen that definitely grow. It would be something that as a school, everything that comes to us as a school, we have to take it in terms of, you know, what do the children feel about it, to consult with the children and to make sure that people are wearing things so that others understand it. So, I, so I'm sorry, Nicola, it hasn't come up in my time as anybody wearing one into school, but there have certainly been conversations about um, the Easter lily around the time that we were looking at the, the 2016 commemoration. Right. Well, the, um, like I appreciate that that the the sports emblems and that are um, allowed and celebrated, and that and that's great. Um, I just want some kind of clarity on that. But thank you for your answer. The other point I want to make um, broadly was um, this whole conversation this morning has been around primary mostly, and we know that our primary schools are integrated as well. What about preschool and early years? Um, how about this integrated sector in the early years provision? Thanks, Nicola. Sam, do you want to come in on that? I think you're muted, Sam. Sorry, Chris, I, I didn't quite hear. Um... So the, quest, the question was about... Uh... Early. Oh, Chris is away. Um, so it was about um, po or preschool and early years and how involved integrated sector is um, in these the in those years. Uh, Nicola, all, all many uh, primary integrated schools have either a nursery or a preschool attached to them. Um, there, there is a growing number of nurseries and preschools that are exploring. Um, how they can become formally integrated. Um, and certainly we would welcome uh, that development in terms of uh, the growth of integrated education. Um, and equally, like, like all uh, primary schools, uh, it, it, it's much more about demand and, and resources in terms of our nursery and preschool. I'm not quite sure if that answered your your, your question, Nicola, but um... No, well no it does. Um I just wanted to kinda of know how involved they were or if it was if there was like um room for growth or then for integrated practice and principles in that area. Sorry, Amanda wanna come in there? Just speaking to some of, I'm on the APTIS group, which is the Association for Principles from Integrated uh, Schools. And yes, I think this the whole area of growth. Has been has come to the forefront of our minds recently because um, the demand is there right from nursery up, Nicola. Um, and the sad thing is that we can't meet the demand uh, because of places, because of peg places, but also because of um, as you go as you go higher from those preschool places, then that demand increases when it comes to primary and post primary. And I suppose that's the, the interesting conversation that we're having today is. We're all saying that, you know, naturally parents are starting to see the benefits of educating children together. But what seems to be sometimes precluding that is the systems that we are working within, the structure of the educational um, uh, establishments, uh, uh, and, and not having enough opportunity for those parents who do want to say from that tender age of three and four that I would like my child to, to go to school with the, the, with the young people they may have met of hospital when they were born, you know, because that's your first point where children then have to be um, separated. They've, they've come into the world. You've been to the Royal. You've been to the Ulster. As a mummy, I didn't care who was next to me in the bed next to me, who had the baby and what, what religious background that baby was from. And then that's where we see things then start. You have to make choices at that tender age of four. Um, and you have to choose then what type of, of nursery your child goes to. And there should be parental choice. And we heard this today that, you know, it's important that our parents do have choice. But it would be lovely to see that the norm is that you have within your area the choice of being able to go to an integrated nursery, primary and post-primary. Yep, absolutely, Amanda. I agree with that. Um, listen, thanks to the three of you again. Um, it was a really informative discussion this morning. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Nicola. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA?
Hi, Amanda. So, Amanda, Hilary, um, thanks for your, your evidence today. Very interesting. Um, and hearing about the success of your GA teams in, in, in Leggan College, it's exceptional. I let up when I hear about young kids get involved in GEA who are not from traditional GEA backgrounds and being coached. So I say well done to Gary Connolly, the coach in Lagan, and to the other coaches of other uh, integrated colleges where there has been success in the GEA pitch, uh, especially in relation to the JJ O'Reilly Cup, um, otherwise known as John Joe O'Reilly. He was the first uh, captain to lead an All-Ireland winning team outside of Ireland. They won the Polo Grounds in New York in 1947. Sadly passed, J. John Joe, um, infamous, legendary cabin man, uh, chieftain of the O'Reilly clan, and a big, big part of the history of the GEA. So, um, as I say, I line up when I hear about young kids being successful in GEA pitch. You're not from a, from a GEA background, so well done. Um, in relation to a stat you've quoted, which is for, first, you know, it's, it's front and centre in terms of your presentation today. Sam, and that was the 2018 Sky News Attitudinal Survey, where you say 69% of respondents agreed that every school in NI should be integrated. Could you give me more information on that survey? Where was that survey conducted? How many uh, okay. contributors to that survey? Or how, how substantial is that survey? How substantial is it? Well, the methodology of it would have been um, approved by the British Polling Council. Um, it was a Sky uh, News survey that was looking at um, the anniversary of the 1998 signing of the Good Friday Agreement and having a look at some of the uh, commitments in the Good Friday Agreement, inc including to encourage and facilitate integrated education. Uh, the methodology behind it would be that over 1,000 people would have been surveyed to make it a representative sample of um, Northern Ireland. So the robustness of, of it is, is certainly there. Um, I chose to use the Sky News survey in uh, the, the briefing because uh, the IEF uh, continually use lucid talk uh, to carry out polls um, and because we commission them polls, sometimes they, the, the, the polls can be challenged that there is an agenda. Uh, and the reason we do those polls is to, um, to get a snapshot of, of attitudes um, of, of the wider Northern Ireland population towards integrated education. So the reason I chose the Sky one is because it was, it was an independent, separate poll, but without doubt, it reflects successive polls over this last 20 years where there is absolute support for integrated education, which is always sitting around the 65 to 80%. And, and Justin, I'd be more than happy to share those polls that, that we have commissioned, that other organizations have commissioned, and for that matter, yeah. the, the, the Good Relations Guide as well. Uh, which, which also reflects uh, similar similar stats when it comes to polls. Can you give me some feedback um, in terms of your assessment of the UU UNESCO report from recent weeks in terms of education in the north? Uh, the, these are the transforming education uh, briefing papers that we partly fund along with a number of other organisations. Mm -hmm. uh, the, 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 the concept behind those briefing papers is to shine a light on the uh, major issues that, that, um, hi, uh, that, that, that create a, the segregated structures on our, of our education system uh, from the administrative structures down to what goes on within the classroom. Okay. Um, I'm just, I, I'm a big, I'm supporter of concept of integrated education completely. I fully support your ambitions. Um, however, I, I'm, I'm a bit annoyed that the sort of uh, prevalence of thinking that schools who are not integrated are bastions of bigotry, because that's just not the case. And I went to a Catholic controlled school and I wasn't, I wasn't taught to be us or, us or them or them versus us. 
I was taught very good, you know, very diver diverse group of uh, people, and um, I just don't like that sort of view that schools are not integrated or baskets are everybody because we certainly were not in, in the school I went to. When, when, when Yuri was being blown up to bits all around us, we, we remained completely detached from politics and we were taught to, to respect everybody and that's how I was raised and that's how um, I think most schools in the north raise their children. So I just feel that, that view that's prevalent here in, in this discussion, I, I'm not really comfortable with it. Um, I, I... I, I would have to agree that all no school in in, in Northern Ireland um, uh, preaches or, or, or implies bigotry within the school environment, um, and I don't think anyone uh, within the integrated movement would suggest that at, at, at any point. Um, I think what Amanda and and certainly Hillary have reflected is the difference. In, that happens within an integrated school um, and that is about the celebration of different uh, traditions and cultures which which just can't happen in, in, in schools that have a predominantly single tradition uh, attending their, their, their schools um, so uh, you know absolutely in the mind. Completely, agree with, completely agree with you that um, all schools in Northern Ireland are doing a tremendous job. I think what we we really should be looking at, though, is the role of integrated or the role of education in moving us towards a more reconciled and shared society. Okay, thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Thanks, Justin. Um, can I bring in uh, Morris? Morris Bradley in there. Muted. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Morris. Sorry, Chair. Chair. Uh, Chair, thank you very much. I've listened to the presentation uh, intently here this morning, and thank you very much for that, uh, all three of you. But, you know, as someone who believes in the integrated education system, uh, I, I, I felt it very, very, very interesting, but I believe in one, educa one education system as well. So we should have one education authority. I don't think this country. As I've already said, can sustain an, an integrated education system, a control system, and a Catholic maintained system. So there needs to be a complete rethink of education at authority level. So uh, integrated education should be, and I think it can be, evolved within existing schools who provide excellent education, as Justin has already said, for our children. Uh, and, and a key question that I had has already been asked by William, and that was the discussions that the integrated education movement, as Sam calls it, uh, had uh, discussions with the various churches, and I'm a wee bit disappointed that I didn't really hear an answer that the ed integrated education movement or system has had meaningful discussions with the churches. But can I ask Sam um, how many integrated education schools are currently cited in what would be termed Protestant areas, and how many integrated education schools are currently cited in what would be termed uh, Catholic areas? Now, I'm thinking along the lines of your previous figures within the mainstream education of only 1.1% Protestants attending uh, Catholic maintained schools and only 7.2% of Catholics uh, uh, attending control schools. This suggests to me that the current offering of integrated education is, is, is there's something just not right. Uh, could you may enlighten me a bit there, Sam, please. Okay, I, uh, Morris, I wouldn't have the information in front of me about where... Uh, each integrated school is located. However, uh, I, Ulster University have recently published a paper around school choice, uh, which does a uh, mapping exercise of where integrated schools are, are, are placed and uh, the realities of school choice for parents who want to send their child to an integrated school but either the school close integrated school closest to them is oversubscribed or an integrated school is just far too far away for them to be able to access it. So I'm more than happy to provide you with that, that briefing paper and hopefully that should uh, uh, give you an indication of the location of integrated schools and therefore sort of the broader uh, landscape of, of access to integrated education. 
Thank you very much, Sam. One more question, Chair, if it's uh, all right with you. Thanks, Morris. Yeah, I heard this morning there that somebody had said that they'd asked a friend who had gone through the integrated education system how many friends they would have percentage-wise of the of the opposite tradition. tradition. And, and I heard the figure 10%. Yeah, I find that amazing because my own, but for me, it would be 50%, which uh, I think is normal, whereas I think 10% is abnormal. Uh, while I was a, a keen supporter of integrated education, I do think there needs to be a complete review within the integrated education system of its current offering and its current curriculum offering. How do you feel about that? Do you feel that there's a need to review within yourselves as well? Well, well first up, um, can I just say that the Integrated Education Fund is absolutely delighted uh, with the commitment in the new decade, new approach to an independent review of our education system. And uh, the scope of that, of that review uh, provides, I think, is all with a once in a lifetime opportunity to get our education system right. Um, in, in, in terms of, do we need a review of integrated education? In 2017, um, there was an independent review of integrated education where there were 39 recommendations and we're still uh, trying to ensure that those recommendations are implemented by the department. Um, I'm aware that some of those recommendations may go into the new independent review. Uh, but again, we welcome that as an opportunity to see a much more integrated education system uh, from delivery at a structural level to in the classroom. Okay, thanks, Chair. Chair, an awful lot of questions have already been answered, so thank you very much for your time and thank you very much for your presentation, folks. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Morris, uh, and thanks very much uh, indeed uh, to Amanda, Hillary, and Sam. Uh, can't let this go without saying that some of the some of the schools referred to as naturally integrated and inclusive don't even include association football. Never mind Gaelic association football. As a as a as a full on bias association football man, um, I'll, I'll make sure I, I get the spoke in on on that one. Um, but yeah, thanks very much indeed for your, your presentation to, uh, uh, today. Uh, for, from from my point of view, the um, you know the, the the structures in the Northern Ireland education system that separate our children uh, too often are are socially and financially unsustainable, uh, and I, I think we we need more. Uh, options and choice for for children to be educated together. I think multiple surveys uh, and research has shown that to be the case. And I know in our next presentation we'll maybe look at at some of those structures and systems um, that um, act as challenges to integration uh, in a bit more detail. But thanks so thanks so much indeed for your your time today. Um, as you mentioned, the independent review of education is coming up, and I think I think it is important that we. We ask the type of questions that we've asked today and that we'll have this conversation in a respectful way to try and make sure that we, we do have uh, an integrated and sustainable school uh, and education system in Northern Ireland. So thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. And thank you to the committee for their, um, for their engagement and, and their questions. Very much appreciated. Thanks. Okay, can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove witnesses and all, add all members back into the spotlight and to keep them there until the end of this session. Can I ask the clerk to summarise any other actions or requests for additional information resulting from our briefing? Thanks, clerk. Yes, Chair. Um, I suggest that um, the committee write to uh, stakeholders on the occasion of um, Integrated Education Week um, after 40 years of integrated education, so primarily seeking a, the position of the churches um, in terms of their support for integrated education, um, having seen it in practice over this period of time, and um, I suppose on the grounds of the basic proposal um, that is a reconciliation measure. Um, then as well, um, just some of the matters that were raised and that the department might respond to are about um, the future growth of the sector, um, the department's use of area planning 
um, to uh, facilitate and encourage um, integrated education, um, how it assesses demand, um, and as Robbie said, how to how to square residentially segregated topography with you know an opening up of the school estate, um, and maybe to detail the differences in process um, for the integrated movement. Um, with development proposals and area planning as distinct from other school sectors. Um, okay, thanks, Clark. Members, members want to add any other uh, actions or requests to that? No, content to agree those actions, members? Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Okay, members, um, as time is short then, I'll, I'll move us on to our next agenda item, which is our uh, Ulster University UNESCO Centre briefing. Can I ask Assembly Broadcasting to remove members from the spotlight and to add our witnesses? And can I refer members to a briefing note from the committee clerk at page 30, a briefing paper from the Ulster University UNESCO Centre at page 34, an Ulster University briefing paper on the Certificate in Religious Education at page 46, and Ulster University Transforming Education report at page 55. And can I welcome Dr. Matthew Milliken from Ulster University? Uh, you're very welcome, Matthew. And uh, can I give you uh, 10 to 15 minutes to make your opening statement and then take questions from the members? Thank you. Certainly, thank you very much, Chris. Um, just checking, it's a, a new format for me. Is everything working fine at your end? We can, yeah, hit loud and clear, Matthew. Thank you. Brilliant, brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, first of all, good morning, and uh, thank you for inviting me to share my research with you this morning. Um, the division between the communities here is reflected and arguably sustained in the divisions between our school systems. Shared education is undoubtedly making inroads and in creating opportunities for young people from different schools to learn alongside one another. But the inspectorate has identified that the potential of shared education to impact and reconciliation has been constricted by a reluctance on the part of many teachers to engage with the issues of identity and conflict in the shared classroom. Education needs further transformation if it's to contribute effectively to the building of a peaceful society, and teachers must be at the heart of that process. There's been very little research conducted into the way in which the community division in education has affected patterns of teacher deployment between the various sectors and the careers paths taken by teachers. The limited research that, that did exist was conducted by Ulster University back in 1977 and the Equality Commission between 2002 and 2004. Both of these identified that on the whole, schools here are staffed by a body of teachers whose community, uh, community identity is consistent with that of the pupils that they teach. In 2015, the UNESCO Centre uh, to Ulster identified that this pattern of employment is affected by four areas of policy. Separation of primary school teachers undertaking the B.Ed. at St Mary's and Strandmillis. The place of RE within the school curriculum and the wider influence of uh, religious uh, aspects within education. The requirement of, for teachers and maintained primaries to have a completed a certificate of religious education that's approved by the Catholic trustees. And the teacher exception from protection under the fair employment legislation. It's commonly presumed that teachers will follow a community consistent path from birth through to employment, that the primary school that they attend will be aligned with their religion or their community identity, as will the post primary school that they transfer to. Those pupils who decide to pursue teaching as a career may choose to enter a community consistent college, St Mary's or St Millis. Here they will be prepared for teaching in either maintained schools attended almost exclusively by Catholic pupils, or controlled schools attended mainly by Protestant students. We expect teachers to promote and deliver shared education programmes, yet by virtue of the community consistent path described, they themselves are unlikely to have had any meaningful professional experience of engaging across the divide. In a society where we are raised to be careful of what we say in mixed company, 
it's small wonder that there's a particular reluctance to raise contentious issues in shared education programs. This is potentially exacerbated for teachers whose career paths have been limited and their opportunities to make contact with the other side have been restricted. The introduction of effective fair employment laws was one of the key demands made by the civil rights movements in the 1960s. The government responded by tabling equality legislation. And since 1973, the authorities here have ensured the development of a culture of recruitment and employment that is underpinned by effective fair employment practices. Teachers, however, have always been outside the scope of this protection. It's perfectly legit legitimate for an employing authority to discriminate between applicants for teaching posts in grant-aided schools solely on the basis of their faith. Also, unlike other organisations in Northern Ireland that employ 10 or more staff, the authorities that employ teachers are not required to monitor their practices for fairness or to record the community composition of their workforce. The teacher exception here has also been upheld in European law, and you will be aware that its removal was debated in Stormont in 2016. That debate was to some extent informed by outdated research that conducted by the Equality Commission at the turn of the century. But how is this state of affairs justified? Under the 1989 Education Reform Order, all grant-aided schools in Northern Ireland are required to provide an act of daily collective worship. They're also mandated to include religious education in the curriculum for all pupils from foundation to key stage four. Unlike post-primary subject-specific teachers, primary school teachers are generalists. They're required to teach all subjects within the curriculum, including RE. Those teachers which, wishing to teach in primary schools in the maintained sector are required to demonstrate that they can do so in line with Catholic principles. This proof takes the form of a special certificate. The certificate in religious education is provided routinely to all students at St Mary's and to those primary school postgrad students at Ulster University. It's only recently been made available to Strandmiller students in-house as an optional module thanks to support from St Mary's. The right of a school to select teachers according to their faith was a key demand of the Protestant churches in return for their agreement to transfer their schools to the state in the 1920s. Accommodation has historically been upheld by the Ulster Teachers Union and others representing unionist interests as protecting Protestant teaching jobs in the controlled sector. It was argued that, without the exception, Catholic teachers who had the certificate would be able to access 100% of the available primary school posts, while Protestant teachers could only apply for 50%, those in controlled schools. The research undertaken on behalf of the Equality Commission suggested, in addition, that there was a chill factor present, preventing teachers from moving into a school sector associated with the other side. My research was completed in autumn 2018. In it, over a thousand teachers in mainstream primary and post-primary schools completed an online questionnaire. That's roughly 5% of all teachers in Northern Ireland. I'm therefore able to claim statistically, uh, ac statistical accuracy, accuracy with 95% confidence within 3%. Where previous research had identified that only a very small proportion of teachers had crossed the divide in any school sector, this new research has revealed that there's more movement than might have been expected. Movement was least conspicuous in maintained primary schools, where less than 2% of teachers, 1 in 50, were identified as coming from a Northern Irish Protestant background. Around one teacher in 16 employed in controlled primaries was a Northern Ireland Catholic. Unsurprisingly, the pattern in integrated schools was more mixed. And across all sectors, a proportion of teachers were identified as having come from outside Northern Ireland or as, or as not identifying with either dominant community. Non-selective secondary schools show more permeability. It's no longer that unusual for a teacher educated through the Catholic system to teach in a controlled post-primary school. Around 17% of the workforce in these schools have crossed the divide. The requirement to be in possession of the certificate can only be extended to RE teachers and those with a pastoral role 
in post-primary schools with a Catholic ethos. Other posts have no such restrictions, and consequently around 8% of those teaching and maintained secondaries come from a Northern Ireland Protestant background. Again, the, co the composition of the staff rooms in integrated schools shows a greater mix. Nearly a quarter of all teachers in non-denominational non voluntary grammars are Catholics, and around a sixth of teachers in Catholic voluntary grammars are Northern Ireland Protestants. Notwithstanding the increased staff diversity that was recorded in almost all sectors, a proportion of teachers were observed to have followed a community consistent path through the whole of their education and professional careers. 38% of all Protestant primary school teachers and 48% of Catholic primary school teachers were recorded as being culturally encapsulated. They had never really had encounters with the other side, professionally. Indeed, primary school teachers are considerably less likely to have spent a significant time being educated alongside students from the other side than the plumber who fixes the primary school's toilets, who will have learned their trade at a mixed further education college. Finally, just the considerations that I'm asking the, uh, the committee to, to, to look at. Teachers are denied the protection from discrimination that other workers can take for granted. This has been justified as offsetting other practices, policies, which may have a discriminatory outworking, principally the certificate requirement and maintain primary schools. As a result, pupils, particularly at primary school, are unlikely to be taught by a teacher from outside of their own community. A substantial proportion of teachers have had no experience of a professional life outside the perimeters of their own cultural community. Teachers involved in shared education programs have been seen to avoid engaging their pupils in lessons about the very issues that, we, that need to be addressed to achieve some measure of reconciliation. There is, however, some evidence of change. In an overcrowded market, an increased number of teachers have made a pragmatic choice to step across the community divide in education. Schools, and particularly voluntary grammar schools, appear particularly open to engaging the teacher that best fits their needs, and not just the best teacher of a particular faith. The certificate has been designated as an occupational requirement for all of those teaching in Catholic primary and nursery schools. Many Catholic schools in GB, where the national RE curriculum has been developed along multi-faith and inclusive lines, only require those teachers directly involved with certain year groups to be in possession of a similar certificate. The content of the English certificate was specifically revised to better prepare non-Catholic teachers for working in a school with a Catholic ethos. As a consequence, approximately 50% of the teachers employed in Catholic schools in England are non-Catholics. The FETO exception appears to have become something of an anachronism, offsetting one potentially discriminatory policy by maintaining another does very little to promote inclusion. I therefore respectfully encourage the committee to encourage the panel that is soon to be reviewing our education system to consider both the FETO exception and the certificate in order to make a significant transformative move towards the creation of a fairer system for the employment of teachers and to ensure the best education for all of our children. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Matthew. Um, we're short on time, so I'm going to go uh, straight into other members, and hopefully I'll have some time for questions at the end as well. But um, thank you so much for that, that detailed presentation, Matthew. Uh, Clark, have we resolved Pat's connectivity issues? Yes. I yes. Think okay. I, think I can, yeah. Deputy Chairperson, Pat Sheehan, MLA. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and, and thank you, Matthew. I apologise, I missed the very start of your presentation. My line dropped off for some reason. Um, just a couple of quick questions. One, first of all, do you know what the current position of CCMS is in relation to FIDO? And secondly, if, the, if this exemption were to be scrapped, what impact would that have on our education in the short, medium and long term? Thank you. In terms of CCMS, it's not so much CCMS that uh, are required to have a position on the certificate. Uh, the certificate, or FITO, uh, it's the um, the Catholic trustees would be my understanding. 
um, CCMS are there to uh, enact policy uh, that's provided down. So uh, it would it would be the the trustees that would make that decision. It's hard to uh, speculate exactly what the impact of the removal of the uh, of the veto exception would have. Um, I think certainly in my conversations uh, and the interviews that I had with teachers, it does not appear to be widely used as a method for selecting teachers. It's a historical doc it's a historical uh, exception that's been on the books for a very very long time, um, but it really it seems to have passed its best by date. Uh, when you speak with uh, with principals, principals want to employ the teacher that best fits their needs. Uh, they don't want to uh, have to simply look at, uh, at faith as a way of determining which teachers they want to employ. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Pat. Yeah, Matthew, just, just to uh, capture that, I suppose, uh, the exception of teachers from the Fair Employment and Treatment Order in effect, permit schools to lawfully discriminate on the basis of religion when employing teachers? Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I, uh, uh, a, a, a school interview panel can directly choose between one candidate and another solely on the basis of their religion. So while that may affect um, a Catholic looking for an employ employment in a Protestant school, in a controlled school, it could also uh, be called on a, in a in a maintained school uh, if a teacher were to be employed who is a, seen to be a, a more practicing Catholic than one who is perhaps more lapsed. Uh, that could be a legitimate uh, factor in in selection, or potentially between denominations in a controlled school. If the controlled school has a, a board that is predominantly Presbyterian and they want a Presbyterian rather than a Church of Ireland or a Methodist teacher, they could call on that as well. So there, it, it's it's multifarious uh, and nicely actually uh, in uh, integrated schools. Uh, integrated schools perhaps want a balance of Catholic and Protestant teachers on their workforce. They can also call on the FETO exception as a way of uh, legitimately selecting to ensure that they have as close to a 50-50 balance of uh, of teachers as, uh, on their staff. I, I, I would agree with you that uh, in this day and age that, there are that, that I'm profoundly uncomfortable with that provision. I, indeed, uh, I'm scoping uh, private members legislation to see if that can be uh, changed before the end of this mandate. It's my understanding that it rests with the executive office rather than the Department of Education to amend that legislation. Um, so maybe an action from today can be to write to the Department of Education and the executive office to get an update with regards to the amendment of that legislation. Okay, th thanks, Pat. Thanks, Matthew. Uh, can I bring in Robin Newton, MLA? Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I thank Dr. Milligan uh, for being with us today? Much of what you said is probably fairly well known to us, but the detail of, of what you said uh, probably gives us a, a much greater insight uh, into restrictions in, in uh, careers uh, and, and indeed uh, opportunity uh, that we should all be encouraging for uh, teachers to pursue their profession, uh, regardless of whichever school uh, that it's in. Can, can I just ask you about uh, two or three things that you had mentioned within your, your summary? Mm -hmm. uh, it said since, since 2019, the St. Mary's CRE -E course has been available on site um, at Strand Mellis, but also that the research undertaken through your own university identified that Protestant teachers who have completed the CRE course did not feel that it equipped them to adequately provide religious instruction. Yeah. Uh, if that is the case, what would, what would need to be, I'm assuming that 
we don't particularly want to encourage it. But where is the gap then that doesn't allow them to feel that they are eligible to apply for a course? In a... I, I think there's a there, well, there's two there's there's two dimensions. Um, there's the course itself, and there's uh, an understanding of food with uh, with teachers, even in the post primary sector. Uh, teachers would still believe that without the certificate they cannot apply for posts in a in a maintained school. Uh, those teachers who don't have the certificate. Um, what you also see is that teachers would be teachers who go to uh, to initial uh, uptake initial teacher education in GB tend to go to. Uh, community specific colleges. So uh, the Catholic teacher, the Catholic student from Northern Ireland who goes to university in Liverpool will go to a Catholic uh, college where, that provides the English certificate uh, and the uh, Protestant teacher will go to a, a non-denominational uh, secular college that doesn't provide it. So the, there's a there's an divergence of routes even for those who, uh, who attend uh, uh, teaching courses off the island. Um, within the Stranmilla setup, the, the course is offered, uh, had previously been offered um, by distance learning, but uh, as a result of, uh, of discussions that commenced, I think, after the last review of the place of the certificate, um, in 2013-2014, the uh, Stranmillis and St Mary sat down together to try to work out some way that the uh, that the course could be delivered in-house. Stranmillis has, at the last estimate, about 30% Catholic uh, students, um, where the figure for Protestant students at St Mary's is nominal. Um, the course at uh, at Stranmillis has been uh, is essentially the the St Mary's course uh, endorsed by St Mary's, but um, uh, but uh, delivered by uh, Stranmillis staff. So those staff that had taken the course here, uh, and those Protestants that had then gone on to try to teach in maintained schools that had, been, had got jobs in maintained primary schools simply find that they weren't familiar with the routines of the uh, of the faith they weren't re re familiar with the practice of the faith they didn't feel confident in engaging with their students uh, preparing them for sacraments or so forth um, they still felt uh, very much in a minority and very much um, uh, out of uh, fish out of water, I think would be the expression. Uh, in England, they also have a similar requirement. They also have a similar certificate, but uh, the certificate requirement was reviewed uh, by the bishops in England specifically to attract more non-Catholics to um, to teach in Catholic schools, and uh, that seems to have had a dramatic effect. Uh, as I said, there are 50% of non-Catholics employed in, uh, in Catholic schools in GB. Can I, can I ask you, Dr Mulligan, then, does that mean that the English certificate um, is a different certificate in terms of the... Oh. Let's see, Robin's... You just... I, 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 hopefully we'll get Robin back there, Matthew, but I think Robin was asking, is the English yes. certificate different to those provided and, in Northern and the, Ireland? It is. The, it's a common certificate. Uh, a, the, uh, the universities, the colleges that provide the certificate, uh, the institutions that provide the certificate in Ireland uh, have to be endorsed by the, by the bishops, um, the certificate that they provide. Um, and there are a number of uh, of institutions in the south that provide the certificate. There's uh, Saint St. Mary's here in the north, and also this, the version of the certificate that is delivered in, uh, in at Ulster, which is delivered to all students uh, in a common course. 
um, which is quite a uh, a novel way of, of delivering it. It's delivered by uh, by a, a Catholic uh, and a Protestant side by side, uh, and both Protestant and Catholic uh, students sit the same course. That's for the postgrad. Uh, the course in England is endorsed by the bishops in England, and it's a slightly different course, and it has slightly different requirements and slightly different uh, setup. And uh, the course, there's another course for uh, for teachers undertaking a uh, Catholic certificate in Scotland, and the Scottish bishops have a, again a slightly different perspective. So it's uh, the the, uh, the trustees recognise certificates, I think, from 42 different institutions on and off the island, including. Uh, a course that's provided in Canada and Australia and bits and pieces. I okay. imagine that was just for individuals. Okay, Robin, are you, are you back there? Do you want a final comment? Did you catch that? Okay, I, I, I do, Chair. I, I suppose uh, Dr. Milligan, in your in the final point in your summary paper, uh, you've recommended that CRE and FETO exception be considered within the review of education. If you were to make a recommendation to the review, which I suspect you will be doing, um, what would that recommendation be? Um, it's not necessarily my place to make a recommendation. I'm a, uh, an academic researcher. That's uh, in the power of, of others. But I, I would like to say that I don't... If I, if I were forced, the fetal exception has... <clears throat> has passed its sell-by date. Having two discriminatory practices to offset each other does not seem like uh, a very fair way of doing things. So I would uh, I would advocate for the repeal of the, the FITO exception. Uh, and for the, uh, for the certificate, I would say, do, does, every, does every single teacher in nursery and primary school need the certificate with, to preserve the Catholic ethos? Or is it perhaps something that specific teachers could be required to have that are preparing pupils for specific sacraments uh, that have specific functions in respect of that? Um, and in parallel with that, I think there is potentially a need to revise the uh, the place of uh, of the, um, the the concept of religion and religiosity that is. Uh, uh, is included in the school curriculum. Um, I think it's all of these things are interconnected. It's not possible to look at one without looking at the other. Uh, and I think uh, I totally welcome the the full review of the education system, but uh, it needs to look at the complexities and the interconnectedness uh, and it, be aware that if you do one thing, it's going to have an impact on other things. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Matthew. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Members, I think we've got about half an hour left, max, and I think I've got six members to get through, so I'm really going to have to keep us strictly to five minutes per member and ask for our, our questions and our answers to be as concise as possible. I realise this is a, a really detailed and interesting and important matter, but on that note, um, <laughs> for better or worse, I bring in Daniel McCross of MLA. <laughs> for better, always for better. Uh, I'm always concise, Chair. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, thanks very much for the presentation, Matthew. Um, I'll go straight to it. Considering the significance of the Certificate of Religious Education, we all student teachers, including those with all faiths and known, currently have adequate access to the Certificate of Religious Education if they desire to attain it. Secondly, is access also easily available to teachers currently teaching as opposed to student teachers? And finally, how does this relate to teachers trained outside Northern Ireland, including those in the Republic of Ireland? Well, I suppose, Daniel, thank you very much. The, uh, to address the final question first, the certificate is uh, awarded uh, and recognised by the bishops on the whole island. So uh, those who uh, undertake teacher education in the South and uh, obtain the certificate would b by uh, de facto be recognised as having the certificate in the North. Um, the, 
No, I, no they're advanced so that I'm going to have to ask you what the other two were. <laughs> uh, we all teachers, uh, including those of all faiths and known currently, have adequate access to the certificate of religious education if they desire to attain it. And the, the other point was, uh, is access also easily available to teachers currently teaching as opposed sure. to student teachers? Sure, they all have access to it. Um, but the question is, do they want to go for it? Do they see a career in the maintained sector? As well, because I suppose of the veto exception, there's a, a feeling of, sure, I, as not a Catholic, won't get a job anyway, so why do I do that? Um, yeah. If you go to Strand Millis, uh, you do it as an additional course. So you have to take more time on top of the course that you're already doing in order to do the course. Uh -huh. whereas, it's, whereas it's integrated for St. Mary's and it's integrated for those teaching in uh, or uh, training in, uh, in Ulster. So the, uh, the St. Mary's, so the Stranmillis course requires a more active commitment uh, to undertake it. Uh, so that it's, while it's open, it's not necessarily availed of in, in the same way. Now, the Stranmillis course only, uh, St. Mary's version of the uh, Stranmillis, uh, has only been available since 2019 uh -huh. since, uh, for the new intake. Uh, and they are, um, <laughs> we've had a very strange year. <laughs> so uh, it it's, hasn't been able to be reviewed what level of uptake there has been and what, uh, how, how successful that has been. We'll see that at the end of the BA Ed course and how many people go through it. And yes, there are opportunities. And I spoke with teachers who had taken the course. There is a, a distance learning course that teachers can uptake um, with a Life Light course uh, that's done through uh, Term Baca that, uh, that they can they can do uh, as a as a catch up. There's also a provision in law that if teachers are being transferred between schools to obviate redundancy, that uh, they can have a two year leeway before they actually complete the course. Uh, so they could be transferred from a controlled school to a maintained school in the understanding that within two years they 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 obtain the qualification. But that exception has never been called on. Okay. Did we lose Daniel there? I think we did. I think okay. I bored him into submission. I'll try, I'll try and buy him a few seconds to be reconnected. And Matthew, can, can I ask why uh, a post-primary teacher in particular would require a certificate in religious education or a particular faith background in order to teach in a post-primary school? Well, a... Uh, uh, the RE certificate, the certificate uh, requirement, can only be, be enacted for those teachers who uh, are teaching RE or who have a significant pastoral role. It, uh, it can't be called upon as an occupation requirement for a physics teacher or a chemistry teacher. Uh, okay. that's, not, that's not the way it works. But okay. there is a perception among teachers that... If you talk to uh, teachers uh, on the Protestant side, that they will say, "Oh, but I need the certificate to work in the Catholic school." There's a an enduring uh, perception out there. Uh, and what is the reality? Do they? No, no. Post primary okay. teachers don't require it unless it is specified because they have an RE or okay. a pastoral role. But for primary, that is different. For primary, it is uh, an occupational requirement. It is okay. uh, any post, any permanent post. I also spoke with uh, supply teachers who were allowed to take up posts on a temporary basis without the certificate. Okay. But when the post became Daniel, permanent, okay. they weren't allowed to apply for the yeah. post. Daniel, I've brought you a final question there because you um, you lost connectivity. If you could be as concise as possible, thank you. You're very, you're very good, solid SDL right, support. Right. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Turning to the legislative exemption, did the legislative exemption after it was enacted have any unforeseen or wider consequences than those originally envisaged? Well, the legislative legislative uh, exemption has sort of always been there. Uh, Londonderry's vision for uh, 
for education in Northern Ireland uh, after the setting up uh, of the state in 21 um, was that ed the education system would be non-denominational and that selection of teachers uh, would uh, would not would uh, should be regardless of uh, of their faith background. Yeah. Um, so it was always there uh, because well it wasn't because uh, that didn't get buy in from the Methodist Presbyterian and Church of Ireland churches who in, because the uh, the Catholic Church weren't prepared to work with the new system. Um, the uh, the three Protestant churches who then became the transfer or churches because they gave up their schools into the state system. Yeah. One of the quid pro quos was that they could appoint their teachers according to faith. So the what what has become the teacher ex uh, exception within the fair employment order has been in place in the Northern Ireland uh, education system since 1927. Yes, and, and just a, a very fine, just to, 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 to clarify, uh, has anyone sought the current opinion of school stakeholders on the matter of re removing the exemption? When you mean, when you say stake, school stakeholders, I spoke with um, the teaching unions um, and uh, to an organisation, the, uh, the teaching unions would be in favour of the repeal of the exemption. Um, the one slight reserve was the UTU. They haven't debated it. It had traditionally been uh, uh, in a, a policy that worked in their benefit to some extent uh, historically, but uh, they have. I, I think they've moved away from that position now. Okay, Daniel, sorry to have to cut you so short. Thank, thanks for those uh, pertinent questions. Can I bring in Robbie Butler, MLA? Thank you, Chair. Thank thanks, you, Robbie. Matthew. Um, yeah, most of the questions have been asked. I'd maybe just ask one, but I'm really glad that you give the historical context of the missed opportunity um, that, that was there at the, at the very start. We were in the centenary year for Northern Ireland and the, the description were raging and uh, people like Lord and I could see what the need was and, and, and perhaps didn't perceive the difficulties that would arise. So my single question is this, I've spoken in, this, in this chamber a number of times and, and asked questions, I think it's a perverse uh, legislation. Um, I'm not speaking from a person who is uh, a person of faith, by the way. Um, what have the arguments that have been preferred uh, or offered by those who would be in support of maintaining if any at all, beyond um, uh, uh, sacrament of faith and that type of stuff, and, and because they, they can be picked up in many other ways, I would imagine. So, has there been any substantive evidence or argument proffered by those that would seek to maintain this uh, unequal legisla legislative uh, base? So, Robbie, do you mean what, what's the case being made for the uh, the maintenance of the uh, exemption from of teachers from FIDO? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Matthew. Yeah, um, I, I, it is the only real uh, argument that I've been able to to detect is the quid pro quo that uh, if they have the certificate then we have to have something that protects us. Um, if without the, uh, the exception, they could have uh, access to 100% of all available posts in the primary sector, whereas we could only go for 50% of the, of the posts. Um, that's the main argument. And I think there's also potentially an argument uh, on, uh, on the side of... Uh, uh, of the trustees uh, and the Catholic Church that if the uh, fetal exception were removed, that uh, it starts to place pressure on the uh, on the pervasiveness of the certificate, uh, and by implication, then the focus for further reform uh, falls then on the certificate. Um, so this uh, protectionism is, uh, of sectoral interests seems to be at the core of uh, of any opposition to, the, to its repeal. 
Okay, Matthew, yeah, just on the, on the haze of our previous discussion, we're talking about integrated education uh, mm -hmm. and the top level. Uh, and if we would look at this coming from the top down, uh, our teachers are actually also segregated, and it's, it's very sad in uh, 2021. So that's a look at the site. Thank you very much, Matthew. Sure. Thanks. It, it, it might be useful to get a, a briefing or from uh, you know, from the uh, bodies that require a certificate in, in religious in religious education as to why it is required and what what role teachers play that requires them to uh, hold it. Uh, maybe maybe we could get that in, in due course. Okay. Uh, can I bring in um, William Humphrey, MLA? Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Milligan, uh, for your presentation. Um, I suppose the question is really, um, if a if a teacher coming through St. Mary's um, looking to go into the state sector and a teacher coming through Strand Millet looking to go into the Cathy Maintain sector, if, is the pathway the same and straightforward for both of them? I think your your evidence this morning <clears throat> excuse me, suggests that that's not the case. Would that be right? Um, the the teacher coming out from St Mary's with a certificate um, could access a post in uh, apply for a, a post in a uh, in a controlled primary school. There'd be no restriction on that. The teacher coming out from uh, Strand Millis, who had not undertaken the additional voluntary uh, certificate course would be unable to apply for a job in a maintained primary school. Okay, so so the the additional work to get the certificate, how long does that take? The uh, the course it would go throughout the entire four years of the of the B Ed course that the teachers right. take. It's it's going the, on the, uh, the whole time. Yeah. I mean I think I think in terms of the, the your evidence you said it um, in terms of the certificate or the video, whatever what, people want to call it. Um, it doesn't appear to be widely used when employing teachers. I think was the term you used. Yeah? No, no, I, f I find very little evidence that it was uh, actually being employed, that people were, yeah. were actively saying, we are engaging the terms of the veto exception because we want yeah, to employ this to teacher say. rather than that teacher. Yeah, thanks for that. I have to say, as a person of faith as well, I think that the question then has to be asked, why on earth do we have it? I mean, you talked about Lord Londonderry and education in 1921. We are celebrating Centenary of Northern Ireland this year, mm -hmm. 100 years on. Society has moved in so many ways. And I think this is archaic. There is no such thing, in my view, as lawful discrimination or reverse discrimination. It is discrimination. Uh, we, we need to have a level playing field uh, in attracting young people uh, to go into education. Uh, and, and I think this is something that needs to be addressed. And I think, Chair, um, I, I agree with your comments earlier. I think perhaps we should be pursuing this. I just don't think it's acceptable in this day and age that we should have uh, this, especially with the conversation we had earlier about integrated education, that we should have this um, contending. That's no, I mean, no offence or, or or whatever to anyone um, around this issue, but I just do not think this is fair. Thank you very much, by the way. Appreciate that. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, that's me. Chair, you're muted. Apologies, forgot I was on mute. Thanks, Clark. Thanks, William. <laughs> <laughs> Hasn't happened too often. <laughs> Can I bring in Nicola Brogan, MLA? Thanks, Clark. Thank you, Chair, and thanks, Matthew, for um, your evidence on the report that you provided beforehand. It was very interesting reading. Um, I know you had said there that you had, um, or there was engagement with um, unions. What kind of um, engagement has there been with um, teachers in particular, um, or principals, um, or even like universities about the um, religious certificate or that the, the qualification that's needed to teach in primary schools? I um, lying, sorry, that's what I mean. Sure. Uh, during my research, I interviewed thirty teachers who had crossed 
between the various sectors. So put very bluntly, Protestant teachers teaching in Catholic schools and Catholic teachers teaching in Protestant schools. Uh, those teachers who, uh, were, it was very, very hard to find Protestant teachers or teachers who had come through the Northern Ireland control system who were working in, in uh, maintained primary schools. Uh, those ones that I, I did find um, who had obviously, in order to do that, they had undertaken the certificate, um, had found really that the certificate was a hurdle rather than a useful qualification. It seemed to be a requirement that they had to get rather than something that really enhanced their understanding of what it meant to work within the Catholic education system. Um, it's required, for example, by, um, by teachers in nursery schools and early years teachers and P1 teachers. And uh, one of the teachers was saying, you know, why do I, why do I need this? Uh, there are plentiful resources. Uh, the, uh, the CCMS provides wonderful resources for, uh, for the teaching of RE uh, at those levels. I'm a good teacher. I've learned how to teach. If I've got the resources, I can teach. Um, why do I need this extra certificate? Uh, it, it fell to those teachers. To, and then when they went on up the school, they didn't feel empowered or enabled to engage with, uh, with the subtleties, the delicacies of preparation for various sacram sacraments. So they didn't feel it was a... Those Protestant teachers who had taken the, the course didn't feel it really enhanced their ability to work as teachers. Um, so uh, in terms then of... Uh, what was the other question you were asking? No, that was it. But um, do you think then did Catholic teachers who had taken the course, did they feel that it was of a benefit to them when they were teaching, say, in P4 for making the First Holy Communion and Confession and that? Did they feel it was a benefit or did they comment on that? Not necessarily. But those that did comment on it, it seemed to be it was just what you did. It was just, it was on the course, you did it. Uh, and some of them talked about actually paying lip service to it. It was something that they didn't really think a great deal about. They just, it was just another dimension of the course. Yes. Yeah. So they, just, they just went through and did it. Something they were just used to. Um, just to touch on this morning's um, briefing about integrated education too, do you see then, how do you see um, the achievement of more like cross community staff and within their schools assisting in integrated, the integrated sector? Well, in terms in terms of uh, what I, what I saw was uh, crossover teachers. I'm not uh, I'm not here to advocate and advocate on behalf of the integrated education movement. Um, my uh, concern is that within the systems that we have, how do teachers uh, move between them, and what happens when those teachers move. So there, there were some wonderful examples of very empowered teachers uh, who had crossed over, who were able to give uh, their pupils a perspective that would otherwise have been denied within a single cultural, single community school setting. So there, were, uh, there was an uh, example, for example, of a, a Linfield season ticket holder who was teaching in a, uh, I, I just referencing Chris and his, his association football. Matthew, um, Matthew you're, you're going to give me an opportunity to uh, brag about Glenn Torn being Linfield twice in two weeks here. <laughs> I better move on quickly. Go ahead. <laughs> of a Linfield season ticket holder being a history teacher in, uh, in the Catholic girls' school and uh, how he was able to bring the otherness of his identity into the classroom and provoke debate and create uh, discussions that would otherwise not have been possible uh, if, uh, if that perspective had been absent from the classroom. So it's not a case of um, advocating for integration, but it's a case of saying, 
how can we provide our children with the best possible education, with the widest possible perspectives? And if the school staff room only reflects the same identity and worldview as, uh, uh, as those pupils who are sitting in the classroom, then there's no diversity enters into the, into the teaching. There's no wider understanding comes about through it. Yeah, it's definitely a very fascinating topic of discussion and thanks for bringing it forward. I find just a um, final remark, I find it um, interesting in your report and in your remarks this morning about teachers who are either in controlled or maintained, who've went through that education system and are now working on that there. That's all they've known. And that is strange when you stop and think about it, when no. you think the rest of our careers and how we just mix through everybody. Um, but really fascinating. Thank you, Matthew. Appreciate that today. Thank you, Chair. No worries. Thank you, Nicola. Thanks, Nicola. Can I bring in Justin McNulty, MLA? Thanks. Good morning, Matthew. How are you? Not too bad, Justin. How's yourself? Great, thanks. Um, Matthew, I could listen to you all day. It's, it's, an, it's an education. <laughs> uh, you're obviously a, a very learned man, and um, I'm learning new words today, and um, I just think it's, it's very informative to hear your perspectives. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm disgusted to hear about the video exception. I can't believe that that still exists in this day and age. It's, I find that extraordinary. Um, however, that's been discussed um, at length already. Um, the report is it's not it's not surprising. At the same time, Matthew, the, the content of your support, your report in terms of the culturally encapsulated nature of our education system. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to bring it back to brass tacks here. I feel that there, there, there's, a, there's a taint that comes on to our teachers, there's a taint that comes on to our schools, which is not their fault. This is not their doing. Our no. schools are teaching and make, our teachers, our principals, our school leaders, our school staff are delivering education to the best of their abilities where they are at now. This is not their problem. This is a problem of political leadership. Now, can you call a spade a spade here and call out who's at fault here? Who has directed the delivery of our education system for the last 10 years? Who are responsible for that? Who are responsible for keeping the thing compartmentalised to their own ends? Who is responsible? I think the uh, you've asked a very simple question. Inevitably, the answer to a simple question is a very complex answer. It's not in the last 10 years. It's uh, it's endemic. It's a, It has been... Uh, Sorry, from, sorry, let me rephrase that, Matthew. I don't mean the last 10 years. Who are responsible for it being perpetuated, for no change on the horizon, for it to stay, the status quo to remain? Who's responsible for that? Okay, the, the system as it currently is, it's historical. Uh, and the, uh, the aspirations of uh, Londonderry with the first Education Act uh, after the partition was for a non-denominational system. Um, it was the creation of the uh, divided system was largely a result of um, the, the Catholic Church not wanting to be part of, uh, of, of the gerrymandered state as, the, as they perceived it. The, uh, and the Protestant Church is not wanting to be part of a circular, secular institution. When uh, the trade-off was uh, that the uh, the the Protestant churches uh, gave up their uh, ownership of their schools in order for greater influence in the education system. And thus, the uh, three Protestant churches were embedded within what became the controlled system, and you had the uh, maintained Catholic system as two separate pillars uh, that were developing independently of one another, that were able to construct their own ways of operating that the uh, the Catholic pillar uh, that was being fed by teachers who came through uh, St Mary's St uh, Stranmilla set up to feed the teachers into the control sector so the right down at the very roots of how the system is constructed is where the division started and from where the the, the division grows and is maintained um, the challenge of, as you're absolutely right, this is not the fault of teachers. Teachers, people who want to teach, go into teaching. They see their teacher at the front of the class and they want to be like them. They want to do that job. And how did that teacher get there? So the system becomes 
self-replicating. It just keeps on feeding into itself uh, in, in a cycle that is very, very difficult to break. Uh, uh, there was a, a, a piece of research written jointly between Stranmillis and, uh, and St. Mary's, and they talked about this as a wicked problem, a problem that was so, so difficult and so complex that just even trying to start to solve it uh, was the problem. But uh, I'm inspired by, uh, by a different source, uh, a baseball coach in America, uh, Yogi Berra, said, uh, when you see a fork in the road, pick it up. Look at it differently. Go on, just don't look at the way we've always been looking at it. If you try to do the same thing, you'll get the same problems. If you try to make the same mistakes, you'll just keep on making those mistakes. Learn from where we're at and look at the whole thing just differently and try to create a whole new perspective. Uh, it's not the fault of teachers. Teachers are the victims of this as much as anything else. Okay, um, it's 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 a uh, sad that children can be compartmentalized without their knowing, um, and this, they don't get the bigger, the broader worldview that they're maybe um, entitled to. Um, and teachers as well, you know, for teachers mm -hmm. not to have been coached and tra trained in a manner which gives them a broader worldview is is limiting. Not from an education perspective, from a life perspective, from from a, an existence perspective. So, um, listen, it's very interesting to hear your perspectives, um, Matthew. So, thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks, for that, Justin. Can I bring in Morris Bradley, MLA? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chair, Mark. most of the questions have, have really been raised and, uh, and answered. To be honest with you, but when you said, Doctor Milligan, that I found his, his report both detailed and informative, and uh, I think eye opening. Uh, it's a presentation that highlighted a peculiar problem within the education system, and that is religious segregation in education. Uh, following on from an earlier presentation, integration that really was an eye opener. Uh, the answer may be realized during the up and coming uh, review of our education system, although. To be honest, I, I would doubt that. Uh, but schools should have the ability to em employ the best teachers to ensure the best education to their Absolutely. pupils. Uh, employment based on religion or denomination only serves to prevent the best teacher from actually getting a job. No questions for, for, for Dr. Mulligan, but I would, uh, Chair, I, I would agree with your earlier suggestion that we might direct you to the executive and seek the removal of the fetal on the CRE as soon as possible. So that's basically all I would add to today's discussion. Thank Thanks, Morris. That, that was, that was as usually, way, usual to the point. <laughs> your, your, your victory last night leaves us two points behind the Blues. <laughs> we'll get, you get cool rain of mention as well. Well done, Morris. <laughs> um, Thank you, thank you, Boris. Uh, and I realise we're short for time. Um, Matthew, thanks so much for your, your presentation and your engagement with members today, and indeed for to, to members for those pertinent questions. Um, the pandemic has has obviously uh, curtailed the committee's ability to go into some of these really important issues in, in the level of detail that we would have liked in the shortened mandate that we had. But you've you've given us uh, uh, clearly, as you, as you can see from member responses there. Um, food for thought and actions to be taken. Um, so uh, hopefully that's that's an encouragement, uh, an encouragement, encouraging outcome for the the work that you've invested your time and your expertise in, Matthew. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll maybe stay in touch with you as well if that's okay, Matthew. Not a worry. I'm happy to uh, respond to any questions offline or whatever way. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Cheers. Okay, members, if I can ask Assembly Broadcasting to uh, remove Matthew from the spotlight and to bring members back in, and to ask the clerk to summarise any uh, actions or requests for additional information. Thank you. Okay, members, I should have said on the integrated education, um, uh, we had two more actions, which was just to link up the um, uh, department's role in encouraging um, uh, integrated education with an insight into recent decision making, such as that in regards to Stratford College. Um, also, um, it came across strongly that uh, 
from IEF that schools are intentionally planned and parent-led. Um, so just to ask the department whether the parent governors have equal standing to transferers or church governors um, and why DE has never planned an integrated school. Um, so moving on to the UNESCO um, centre briefing then, um, I suggest that members want to write to the executive office and the department to get an update on the veto exemption. Um, uh, the committee seemed to unite around the view that it uh, appeared to limit the worldview of the education system. Um, and we'd write for that information with a view to getting a briefing. Um, also then write to the, the main churches um, uh, for their views on the position on integrated education, the certificate for religious education, position on teacher exemption and veto, um, and what the continued requirement for veto and the, the certificate are, particularly in post-primary. Um, did anyone have anything additional, members? Chair, can I come in, please? Yes, yes, William, go ahead. Can, can, can I perhaps, if the committee's in agreement, because uh, I think there was a committee across the way on this, can I strengthen that? I think we should write to the First Minister, Deputy First Minister, and Education Minister, basically saying that the committee's view is, and I think we should, uh, in terms of the review of education, the committee's view is that this is archaic uh, and needs to be removed. Um, and, you know, obviously making it review, but to the ministers asking them to take proactive uh, action to actually address it and remove it, in conjunction with conversations, obviously, um, I'm, I'm happy the conversations with the, with the Catholic Church. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, uh, William. My, I mean, my, as I said, my my position or my party position is to repeal the exception uh, of teachers from FIDO. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I don't know every party's position um, and obviously we have suggested that we write to the churches to seek their positions uh, as well so I, I mean I, I'm content for the correspondence to uh, the department and uh, the first and deputy first minister seeking an update on the repeal uh, of the exception of teachers from FIDO to include uh, reference to uh, uh, a view of the committee that that should be the direction of travel if that is agreed um, members want to come in on that I'm conscious that we are going to still hear from the churches as well maybe we might want to hold off on, on that but uh, I, I can have it included from my point of view but other members want to come in just I missed a bit of the recap there um, uh, chairperson because my connection failed so um, William had proposed that the committee come Come around a position and communicate that to FMDFM and and the department. And I think you were just saying, um, shall we do this now? Or shall we do this when we've heard back some more information? Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I I I I, I know my position. However, um, it it might be prudent um, to hear from the four main churches on on the issue prior to uh, uh, you know. Uh, solidifying our our committee position in relation to it, but I'm um, happy to hear from other members. Chair, could I come in there? Yes, yes, Pat, go ahead. Thanks, Chair. I think I would agree with your position that we should probably wait until we hear from the churches. <clears throat> I mean, I, I don't support the FIDO myself, um, but I think we should possibly give the churches a chance to explain their position. Uh, I mean, the reason I asked about the CCMS earlier and the position they have is that I, I detected some tension between CCMS and the Catholic trustees. So it would be interesting to see just where that sits at the moment. Uh, and, and I would be in favour of hearing from the churches first and then dealing with it afterwards. Yeah. I, I think there is an emerging consensus, political consensus. I think it has been in place for some time, um, which makes it harder to understand why there hasn't been action taken to repeal uh, the exception of teachers from FIDO. But I, I think in, in terms of due process, it, it may be prudent to uh, to hear from the four main churches and, and indeed um, not to give them priority over other stakeholders as well if, if uh, you know we can, we can correspond with uh, unions for example and, and anyone else and um, you know like I said in, a, in an ideal world this is maybe an issue that we would have um, 
uh, under. Is the chair gone? Yeah, that is back. I think that's me back. Sorry. Uh, there we go. Um, I was saying we may have undertaken a slightly more discreet, focused piece of work, but uh, mandate length and uh, pandemic uh, curtailed that. But oh, any other members want to come in? No. Okay. So, William, are you are you con content that we we well, work? I, with I, our... I, I worship in one of those those four main churches, and I know you know I'm happy to listen to them. Yeah. The position's not going to be any different at the far end of it. No, I think you're right. I, I, th I think that's fair. Yeah. This is still going to be something which is is not creating a level playing field, and I think we have to accept that. I'm happy to listen to churches. I, uh, you know, when we're allowed to, I go and listen to them as much as I can on a Sunday morning. <laughs> but, but, the, but, but the reality is going to be the same at the far end of this. I think you're right. I think I think there is an emerging... I'd like to think there's an emerging consensus. I, I put a number of parties have a, a clear position in relation to it. Um, uh, and you know, maybe maybe we can reflect that in the correspondence that there there does appear to be a political consensus for the uh, repeal of the exemption, and uh, and and then we'll we'll receive the response from FMDFM and the department and the churches. And if we need to make that clearer in due course, then we can. Is that fair enough? Yep. Okay. Any other members on any of those actions? Sure, just a quick one to hurt back. Justin, yeah. Very quick one, just on the um, integrated education. You've been asked the integrated education, education schools, um, which sports they actually participate in. If we get some representation in terms of what the sports are uh, played in each of the schools. Yeah, it'd be an interesting exercise to get uh, the sports in all schools, Justin, as I said earlier. I think, I think um, it would be an interesting exercise. Um, you, you want that? The. the uh, you want to ask the so just to clarify, you want to ask the integrated education fund if we could get some insight into the uh, types of sports that are are uh, facilitated across integrated schools. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, how many how many schools and what sports are paid in each school? Okay. Do you want to add to that and make it all schools? <laughs> yeah, no, I, don't, I, don't know, I, I don't know if I would do that, <laughs> to be honest with you. But I'd like, we, I'd like to see that information, yes, yeah, so we'll be Okay, well, but, look, could we start at the department, maybe start at the department level then? Um, I'm not sure integrated education fund is, is constituted to undertake that type of an exercise, but we, if we could ask the Department of Education if it holds information for what sports are facilitated in, in all schools, it would seem pertinent to to take it from across the, the schools as opposed to target just a, an individual type of school. Is that fair enough? Well, no, integrated, if it's, if, it's re, if it's truly integrated, it should be representative from a sports perspective as well. Well, should all schools not be inclusive or representative? That's agreed, agreed, agreed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, Is that my sector then? I think sector? Well, yeah, you mean uh, uh, you can... I think in the name of the school it usually gives you a fair indication what sector it's in, but um, I think it would be an interesting exercise, but I think you could start with the department at, uh, and ask them um, if they hold information as to which sports are played uh, in which school. Do you want to go by post-primary school to give them a chance, Justin? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah let's, let's do that. Any other comments, members? No, okay. Clark, any other actions? Or are you content we've agreed the necessary actions there? Yeah, I'm content with that. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Thanks, members. Realize time is running out, so I'll move quickly to correspondence at agenda <coughs> item seven and ask the clerk if uh, if she could uh, summarize the actions. Um, okay. So... Um, on page 64, there are 13 items of correspondence and a summary note is included at page 65. Um, as the chair flagged at the start of the meeting, um, there are several pieces of correspondence from the minister which we we'll want to um, read in, in advance of next week's briefing. Um, so the first of those um, uh, is uh, we start 
that's 7.2. Then 7.3 on page 246 is correspondence from an individual seeking clarity on additional issues regarding the Wales um, qualification issue um, and in, in closing a letter um, that the Welsh Board wrote to the Minister. Um, so we were made, await a response from the Minister on his statement that equivalent qualifications for YJEC quali qualifications are available from other boards. Um, so are members content that we should forward this additional information onto the uh, department? Agreed. Agreed. Agreed, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, item 7.6 is a response from the department indicating that it's conscious that internet access is an issue for many people, um, particularly those in a rural setting, um, and it lists the actions being taken to address that. Um, if members are content, I would suggest we forward the response to Goliath and the NITC who raised this matter with the committee. Agreed. Chair, sure, could I come in there? Yes, uh, Pat, go ahead. I have no difficulty with that uh, happening. Um, but I just wanted to raise the issue that I have been approached uh, recently by a school principal who has told me that she is having difficulties getting devices, IT devices, for key stage four pupils on free school meals. Uh, and I spoke to another teacher recently who uh, had to mark a child absent because he hadn't appeared, and this is in, in the primary sector, who hadn't uh, appeared at the online learning for a couple of days. She went and contacted the mother, and the mother immediately broke down in tears. Uh, uh, she said that she had been using her mobile phone, but she just didn't have, she couldn't afford the data. Uh, to allow the child to continue using her phone uh, to do the online learning. So there are still problems out there. Um, the EA w were supposed to have rolled out a, a program of uh, giving devices to those children who needed them, as well as the problems related to poor Wi-Fi access. Um, so I think it's an issue we should maybe follow up on again, if that would be possible. Thanks. Yeah, that's obviously concerning, Pat. Um, is a particular way we can deal with that? Are you, I, I, I presume you're assisting the individual issue there. Um, perhaps we can um, respond to the department to, to cite the fact that we have ha have knowledge of, of those types of issues that you've raised. Remember, would that be... Uh, sure, Pat, sure, Pat. Sure, I'll let sure, Robin come in as well there and then I'll return to you, Pat. Robin, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, very similar problem, Chair, uh, within my own constituency. Um, and indeed, uh, the parents in that, in that case, um, we were able to make contact uh, with the school. And I have to say the school were extremely helpful uh, in, uh, in 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 how they went went about it, and my understanding is that uh, indeed a, a a very satisfactory situation ha ha has arisen. I don't know the details of of what the school actually did, but I would suggest any school is probably going to want to be helpful uh, where such a situation has. Uh, Pat has uh, uh, experienced uh, on the situation, very similar situation I also experienced. If, certainly, certainly in, in the East Belfast case, the school went, 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 went way beyond what they would uh, uh, be, mm -hmm. might have been required to have done. Okay, so if, if members are content, we could write to the department uh, expressing concern that there are ongoing um, problems uh, for families accessing digital devices and internet connectivity and seek an update with regards to how those problems are being addressed. Chair, you only have to look at our own connections to see how many of us drop out throughout the committee to see how bad the connection problems are. 
Thanks, thanks, Daniel. <laughs> could I, yes, could uh, I suggest we're about to, we're about to, we're about to lose uh, broadcasting, so we'll keep moving. Pat, go ahead. Could could, could I suggest we CC the uh, Education Authority and the, whatever letter we're sending the department? Yeah, happy to send that to the department and the uh, CEO. Agreed. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Yes, Justin. There's a very important matter to raise, and that is special schools and vaccinations. The department only wrote to special schools last week to, for the task them to identify which children were CEB. I find that extraordinary. <laughs> um, some special school staff have been vaccinated in, in their own right, but not because they're staff in special schools. What is age. going on? They're okay. back to school eight weeks from Monday past. Teachers are feeling vulnerable. Teachers' staff are feeling scared. They're feeling left behind, feeling forgotten about. Uh, big announcements yesterday from the executive, but nothing in relation to vaccination for school staff. In Scotland, they've all been vaccinated. They're getting tested twice a week here. Nada. School staff, teachers, principals are really concerned. What is going on? Can we write to the minister for urgent clarification of what's going on with vaccinations for special schools? Good, good proposal, Justin. Yeah, let, let's write to the minister and seek uh, his urgent uh, update with regards to when special school staff are receiving this vaccination. You're 100% you're right, Justin. It, it's long, long overdue and long past being acceptable. Now, our members can tend to agree the correspondence on, on digital uh, technology and on special school vaccinations. Agreed? Agreed. 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 Okay, thank you. Clark, back to you. Thank you. Um, so, members, item 716 was a reply um, from the department uh, which covered some of the arrangements for special school vaccination, including asking the schools to identify um, the uh, cohort of staff and liaising with the public health agency who arranged a booking. But as you say, there are no dates and timelines um, in that letter. And that's um, what we need. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Clark. Um, members, also just a couple more actions on the correspondence. Um, uh, the department gave us um, a reply on legislative um, plans for um, flexible school age starting, or school starting age, sorry. Um, and if you're content, we can note that and copy the response to the individual who raised this, ma this matter with the committee. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, yeah. Similarly, Belfast Youth Forum um, wrote back about uh, relationship and sexual education provision. Um, and some recommendations and suggestions. Um, I propose we would pass those on to the, the uh, department. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. In, in relation to the recently published Children and Young People's Emotional Health and Wellbeing and Education Framework, um, members, are you content to schedule a briefing on that? Agreed. Okay. Um, Agreed, so members, yep. Good. Yep, thank you. Other than that, are members content to dispose of the correspondence as per the summary note at page 65? Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Can I turn the draft summary? Sorry, just very quickly, Robin. Just, sorry, Robin, do you want to go ahead there? Go ahead. That's just to say I need to leave the meeting, Chair. No problem. Thank you, Robin. Thanks, Robin. Um, Clark, can I just check that summary note includes a green uh, an informal briefing from Karen Mullen MLA with regards to the holiday hunger private members bill or do you need agreement on that? Um, well spotted. Um, yeah. Yes, Karen has um, in, due, in due course she would come to the committee for committee stage um, but I think members would be interested in hearing about it now. Um, so, yeah, uh, an informal briefing would be ideal. Yeah, would members be content to schedule an informal briefing with uh, Karen, former Deputy Chairperson, on the holiday hunger PMB? Yep. Agreed? Content, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, um, members content to agree the other items by way of uh, the summary note of page 65. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, agenda item 8 for work program is available at page 180. Are you content that the Department of Education and the General Teaching Council present uh, separately on March the 24th? Um, and uh, accordingly, the committee uh, hear from Professor Lundy on youth engagement models and Autism NI on mandatory autism training on the 14th of April. And on the 21st of April, then we'll have the EA on SEN and the department on the SEN, the new SEN frameworks. If you're content with that, the clerk will make the necessary changes. Does that, that sound like a uh, way forward on the Ford Work Programme? Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Members, any other business? Nope. Okay. Um, further commiserations to William and uh, Linfield. Um, and uh, congratulations to Morrison and the Korean uh, contingency up north. And um, the date and time of our next formal meeting then is Wednesday, the 10th of March, at 2021, by Starleaf at 9:30 a.m. The <coughs> meeting does not adjourn. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.